Hello, everyone, to the Warrior Kings podcast. This name is temporary, subject to change maybe later. But in these podcasts, we're going to be covering stuff that covers mentality, masculinity, and marriage. And today, I have a very special guest. Her name is Lisa Percher Reed. She was an information scientist who moved her career working from big data and AI into a stay at home mom who is now trying to change the world for her kids. She's the founder of the podcast No More Do Better. She's writing a book series called Healthier, which is going to have a total of 13 books, three of which she has written already. Her interests include AI, tech, and all things growth across the board. In this interview, we're going to get into authentic self, mental health, internal values, and tips and trips, tricks for raising your kids. So without further ado, let's get into it. In your podcast, one of the things I want to ask you about was you have the concept of authentic self. And I wanted you to expound on that and like what your definition and what that meant to you is because I think for a lot of people, authentic self means um, different things. And then sometimes in my own personal context, like authentic self means being myself. But then I've also seen authentic self be a cop out for like not self-improving or being mean. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like I'm just authentically um manipulative it's like that's uh, I, I don't, a, I limited, don't... a limited mindset being called an authenticity yes yeah and where i'm yes. just like okay, okay so. i can understand that <laughs> so yeah why do um, you expound on that so for me i think uh authenticity wasn't really something that i even thought about for a long time and then when i started down the, i had an emotional breakdown uh when i was 30 and i was pregnant and i was still working and um i started to dive down this path of like, I, I have to sort this stuff out. I didn't realize I had mental health stuff that needed sorting out. I didn't realize that like perfectionism wasn't just a trait. I didn't realize it was like a mental health issue that I had. Mm. Um, and there were all these things that I was learning about myself. And one of them was that uh, I wasn't comfortable being myself. I changed who I was based on who I was around. And um, I didn't feel confident to just to just be myself around many people at all. Um, and so that idea of constantly having to change myself to suit other people and to people please and to um, try and be what I thought other people wanted me to be rather than actually pausing and considering like, what are my values and what do I care about? And um, for me, becoming my authentic self has been about learning how to hold boundaries, learning to say no, learning to make decisions based on what I value and what I want, not what I think is expected of me and not what... Uh, I think I should be doing based on, you know, like either what, what I grew up believing was what I was meant to be doing or, uh, you know, what society expects, what I think society expects me to do as an upstanding citizen, all that sort of stuff. So for me, it was really about learning that it was okay to be me. Mm. And uh, a part of it was also accepting sitting with the fear of rejection. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Um, and understanding that it's okay for other people not to like me and I don't have to change myself and be someone I'm not just so that other people will like me because what's the point of them liking me if I don't get to be myself? Like, yeah. I never really sat down and thought about it and then the more I learned about myself, the more I realized I didn't even really know myself or what I liked. I just, I just knew who I had become and that wasn't someone I wanted to be anymore. Mm -hmm. Do you know what triggered you? Uh, like, oh, well, I mean, obviously it was the the pregnancy, and then there was one day where where you just had the, the epiphany, or was it? Uh, I broke down in tears at work. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was, I think, I was about seven or eight months pregnant, and like all of my projects were in the red, mm. which is fine, right? I was a senior project manager. Like, my job is to solve that stuff, and actually, okay. for me, tech issues are. Uh, like I love solving tech issues, but most of them were people issues, not tech issues. And I sort of <laughs> had this point where <laughs> I was like, I was a crippling perfectionist, right? I wanted to do everything perfectly. And for me at the time, I understand it now. I didn't then because I didn't know how to hold boundaries. And because I was a perfectionist, those two things combined made it really difficult for me to um, know how to say no or know where the end of my role was. So I thought if I needed to achieve something and somebody else had an issue that I had to help them solve their issue because they were my roadblock rather than just saying like, I have a roadblock. And so um, I kind of had this breakdown thinking like I was just struggling with everything. And there was this one project that somebody described the project to me as if they were felt like they were under, um, you know, those uh, compressive hydraulic presses. Yes. He was like, it's like being under a hydraulic press. And I was like, yeah, that's how it feels. 
and I was seven months pregnant and I just burst into tears. Like I want to prioritize my kid and be healthy and this stress cannot be good for my baby. Like yeah. what am I even doing? And I just broke down crying. Um, mm. Fortunately at the time I had the most empathic manager I could have ever had. And she was amazing. And so um, I think I share the story in one of the podcast episodes anyway, but um, I, I just, she, she just kind of went, you know what, just cancel your meetings. Don't even cancel your meetings. Just go home. Don't sign in for anything. Just make a list of all the stuff you're struggling with and then we'll deal with it on Monday. Like just go home and mm. like breathe basically. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I had this breakdown and then it kind of, you know, I had a kid and then there was the sleep deprivation and there was the complete lack of preparedness and like I'm a child of divorce and I grew up with my dad. So like, I didn't have a mum to go to, to ask questions. And I kind of, mm -hmm. you know, I was up at 2 AM like researching stuff yeah. <laughs> on Google and like, who knows um, what, what that yeah, means. all sorts. Um, and then, so it kind of, that was the initial emotional breakdown. And I saw a therapist a few times then, and I started learning about perfectionism and then, um, I, I think my baby was about six months old. I had a point, I had a falling out with family. Um, it was Christmas and um, like it was all too much and it all built up for me. And it just kind of all came out in this one um, messy falling out. Mm. Um, and then it took me years to like rebuild, my, well, not years, months. It took me months to re rebuild myself as a person. Mm. Um, and that was right when COVID hit too. So it was actually it worked well for me because I yeah. kind of I had time to just focus on my baby and myself yeah um and I completely changed the trajectory of my life we like picked up and left Sydney um left the career behind left all that moved from you know a little 100 meter square apartment to a beautiful acreage and like whole life changed because I realized yeah it wasn't for me anymore yeah the little hustle like it sounds like a lot to, to number one, be pregnant. Cause I can't even imagine what that's like. I've just seen what my wife went through, but being pregnant with all the pressure. And then it sounds like there's family pressure on top of that too. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't family pressure per se. It was, um, unhealthy behaviors that I didn't know were unhealthy mm. and unhealthy relationships. That I didn't know were unhealthy. And like one of the big things for me as well is I had stopped drinking and like my family has a big drinking culture okay. and so that had an impact as well um, because my relationships were changing because I was pregnant because I was so busy at work because um, uh, I felt like I was drowning a little bit in parenthood but I had to I felt the need to like not be honest about that so it was kind of like oh yeah the baby's sleeping no she slept like two hours in total a night like I had nights where I just didn't sleep and so you can imagine the hormonal impacts and the just yeah. general mood impacts of uh, like I was pretty severely sleep deprived for a total of about three to four years. Yeah. <laughs> but that those first six months I was sleeping maybe two, maybe three hours a night. And then because my husband was still working and I was trying to, you know, be grateful that I didn't have to go back to work and all that sort of stuff. I, I tried to hide it from everybody. No, I'm doing fine. But I was like really struggling inside. Mm. So it sounds like almost before that point, you had a hard time expressing feelings to maybe yeah. you and your husband. Yeah. So my husband's really, really good at reading me. He always okay. has been. So he would tell me, like, it looks like you're feeling this way. And I was no, like a complete denial. Like, no, I'm not feeling that at all. Hmm. Um, That's quite interesting. And yeah, he spent years like... Um, he could pick things, you know, like I would I bite my nails when I feel anxious. I know that now, mm. but he would spend, he'd be like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing's wrong. He's like, well, you're biting your nails. I'm like, I just bite my nails because I'm bored. He's like, no, no. Yeah. you bite your nails when you're feeling anxious. Like what's going on? Mm. Like, no, I don't. <laughs> like that happened for years. <laughs> We've been together for 16 years. Like we had those conversations for at least a decade. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think I grew up <sighs> logical and analytical. And it was emotions were table. emotions were something that I avoided. Mm. I think for a while I intentionally avoided them. And then there was a period where I'd been avoiding them for so long that I actually just didn't know how to feel them. Yeah. I, can... I didn't know that they were there. I denied and repressed them for so long. Mm. Uh, I can kind of relate to that because I think like around my age, I was... 15 or 16 which is kind of weird to say because i'm a teenager but there's a long time where i was like i don't know like every day i felt dumb i don't know if it's the same 
but there's I felt like a lack of emotion and there was no up or down throughout the day. It was literally just flat every day for months on end. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's the same. I'm just um, yeah. I'm not sure if that's similar to you or if that was a just I think it wasn't for me it wasn't that I felt numb. I have had that feeling, but for me most of the time was that I felt anxious and stressed almost mm. all the time that it was normal. So okay. to like I didn't associate anxiety and stress. Like, you know, people would ask me often, like, how do you deal in these high stress projects and things? Because I was actually in relatively high stress roles. But to me, I was like, no, nah, I thrive in these situations because I didn't see it as stressful because my stress levels were so high anyway that it didn't feel any different mm -hmm. to me. So I was uh, comfortable yeah. <laughs> in stress. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. There's when you're um, telling me about that, I, had, I, I wrote down uh, like about two questions. One of them was um, just because... I actually had trouble figuring out what a toxic relationship was growing up. It took me a long time. I didn't figure that out until I was like 25. Um, so you went I'm before me. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but I mean, compared to everyone else, like it, it just seems like that's a long time to figure out like this is not a healthy behavior. Um, and so I was wondering if you're, if you wanted to give, if you, if you don't want to, that's fine. But if you wanted to give like one or two examples of like um, things that were like a toxic thing that was, being done to you maybe in the workplace or whatever that obviously should not be happening just in case there's people in the um, audience who are like me at 16 who haven't figured it out yet <laughs> <laughs> uh so uh, um let me think so toxic in terms of family when i was younger that i didn't realize was toxic was um i had a family member who who suffered from suicidal thoughts and some suicidal behaviors. Mm. And it was like this, it was like this thing that we, like she would tell me about, but I was sort of sworn to secrecy and I, I didn't, I couldn't tell anyone about it. And um, everybody knew there was something and it was like, we just walked on eggshells and then kind of pretended that it wasn't happening or that it wasn't there. And so for me, like understanding that it's safe to talk about things. Okay. And I didn't really learn that as much until like, so from a, as a parent, uh, we, we practice consent parenting. Um, and so uh, it wasn't until I really learned that like teaching my kids, Hey, no matter what anyone tells you, it is always safe to tell mommy and daddy what's going on. Yeah. No matter if somebody tells you it's not safe or that something bad is going to happen, it is always safe. And in our family, we don't keep secrets there can be surprises like birthday presents and that sort of thing, but we don't keep secrets. It's always safe to tell us something. Whereas when I grew up, um, a lot was unspoken and um, I, I kind of, I never asked because things weren't talked about. And then like, I, I kind of have had lived my life for a long time thinking that like, you just don't talk about hard things and that there's some things that you're just not allowed to talk about, even though you know they're happening. Um, and so that was, that was a, a big realization for me and I'm still learning that it's safe to talk about these things uh because like even now I can feel my hands starting to sweat with, like talking about you know that, um, that sort experience. of experience yeah mm -hmm. um and then in, in a workplace a toxic situation is what was toxic for me particularly was um when when there is an expectation that people will deliver and deliver and deliver without a break that they'll behave like robots that um it doesn't matter you know like you get that crunch of well, well we've told the customer we're going to do something so you're going to have to figure out how to do it so you know for me when I was still at uni I started working already in fintech and um it was normal for me to to like I thought 16 hour days were pretty regular uh when it was near a project you know like that was just part of well that's what happens when you work on a project it's completely acceptable but like when do you get to hold your personal boundaries and be like well no actually like i need to go home i need to sleep i need to eat yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah. and so and i and i had some really great opportunities in my career but looking back there's a lot of times where if i knew how to hold healthy boundaries uh i would have been a healthy person <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Fintech, because I, I would imagine probably fintechs also. Uh, that's like a multi-billion-dollar industry. 
Oh, it paid well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't deny that. Part. I remember I, I watched this uh, video about this guy who, who worked at Goldman Sachs and it's like 20 hour days were normal. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's kind of That's nuts. just what you do. And if you don't do that, we'll go home. Then, or go home and then we'll find someone else because some other eager young person is going to jump in here. Exactly. Um, that's, that's an interesting uh, environment because luckily in my work life, I haven't had that yet. I've had, I've had parts where it's close to that, but then um, that person, the person who was managing me got let go. <laughs> so I was like, okay, great. Maybe I'll stay here a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, yeah, for me, it's always, it was, I read uh, D- Ray Dalio's book about um, uh, principles and it's, it, he goes into like how he makes all of his decisions and for his corporate structure, et cetera. And one of the things to manage was uh, it's essentially almost like once you're in a manager position, you're almost like a coach. Like you have to let your players rest and then, put them in when they're supposed to perform, but then you can't just have them perform all the time. People need to, people need to rest. Any breaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I think, uh, when you're in big programs, when budget starts to get spent faster than they think it was going to get spent and deliverables aren't happening on time, they crunch the people. Um, and I worked on some amazing stuff and I really enjoyed a lot of my career, but I look back at it and go, yeah, there are other ways to do that. <laughs> mm, yeah, definitely. From from those low points, what would you say are the biggest takeaways or lessons that you think you've walked away with from that? Um, holding healthy boundaries was. Ho- yeah, holding healthy boundaries. Um, one of the things that, like, if I went back into the corporate world now, that would really benefit me is like knowing how to speak to people in an assertive way because I used to be very passive aggressive. Um, and so, uh, it's kind of aligned with the whole healthy boundaries and, and, um, saying no and that, but, but being able to speak in a way that is respectful and, um, and gets your point across and is clear on what is or isn't acceptable. Um, I I kind of, I don't know, I just agreed to everything in my career because I I thought I had such great opportunities and I, I didn't want to miss out on them. (laughs) Like uh, almost like it, it sounds like people pleasing, right? You're just saying yes to everyone, and then, and then you, yeah, everyone adds their work to you, and then you're stuck trying to do all of it. Yeah, and then I would go out every Friday and Saturday night and get hammered, and that was my way of dealing with it, which is also entirely unhealthy. Um, but for me, that was like, it was almost like a badge of honor, like how much I drank, because that's just the culture that I grew up in. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, um, growing up like alcohol was just a part of life. And then it got to a point where, um, had a bad day at work, have a beer. Like that's just how you deal with it. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, it was, it was pretty unhealthy for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, how long were you? And then how long again were you in the, in, the, in that kind of a culture or environment for like, let's say you had a beer for FinTech. Was that? Oh, uh, a, a decade. 10 years. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of stuff to unlearn, I guess, also. A lot of what? Sorry. I was like, so it's like a lot of habits that, because I understand your stage now, your personal development. So it's a lot of uh, stuff that almost like you have to rewire in your mind, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff. And I mean, uh, I've been on my, my journey towards my authentic self uh, for five, four and a half, five years now. Okay. Um, and there's still like, there's still a lot that I learn. Um, and it's, ca- it's kind of like you learn one thing and you start getting better at that. And then you find all this other stuff that you're like, oh, I got to work on that now too. Great. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thought I was getting really healthy here. And now I discovered that new thing that uh, I didn't know I was doing. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, all of it will compound, right? Like you just learn skills here and then those add to your other skills and you don't have to worry about this one as much. Yes. So, yes. All an upward, upward trajectory, which is good. <laughs> um. So now that you're, so you had, you're on your way to your authentic self and then you've had to rebuild yourself. What would you say your internal values are now? Like now that you're in this stage of progress and, or where do you want to attain to, to get those values? Uh, so for me, my core values now are like family, love, and compassion. Okay. So me, my husband, my kids, the four of us were my priority. Um, and then, uh, health. So, um, obviously in, in, all your, across in all, all of areas, those, uh, in all yeah. of those areas. And, uh, for me, like my, I love learning. 
so an information which sounds kind of nerdy but um like the uh acquisition of and dissemination of information is like my passion it's it's my drive mm. um but yeah and then doing that in a way that um improves how i show up for myself and for my kids and for my husband and then how i can help others on that journey too really well said and uh that's a I don't know the adjective is escaping me, but I guess lack of a better word, that's a very beautiful life goal. <laughs> For lack of a better word. Um, that's really good. Uh, on your on your way to this uh, authentic self, what would you say is the biggest unhealthy belief you've had to let go, especially from your past and from all the stuff you've uh, you're essentially it sounds like you're 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 rewiring, right? So how what are the biggest what's the biggest unhealthy belief you've had to let go? That I was unlovable. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Do you, it, know, um, where, do you know where that, uh, I guess, where the inception of that idea first came from? I think so. So my parents got divorced when I was like eight. Mm -hmm. um, and like at the time it was very much, um, oh, your mother isn't a healthy person. So like, this is a good thing. And and I was I was in the household. I was living with her. I, I, I knew that it was healthier for us not to continue living in that environment. Um, but from that, I think the she's not healthy and this is better for you kind of, that was just, oh, okay, that's the reality. So however I felt about it, like, and again, I said, you know, we don't talk about big things in my family. So it was kind of like my parents got divorced and then it was kind of like, okay, life goes on type thing. Okay. And so um, I, I didn't realize until in my 30s that, actually I struggled from like internalizing well, like why, how can, how can a mother not have contact with her daughter mm. or her child? And then when I became a mother, it was just like a, wow, I would do anything for these kids. Yeah. How could a mother not, not yeah. even have contact? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting, actually, because after I had my emotional breakdown, um, <laughs> just say it like it's an everyday thing, uh, after I had it, um, I went to the, the doctor and they recommended I see a psychologist. And I was like, no, because, you know, I'd grown up around the ideas of suicide. So I was like, no, I'm healthy. Like, I don't need a psychologist. Yeah, only that person who's talking about it needs, needs one. Right, oh. right. Which is also an unhealthy view. Um, yeah. Pretty much everyone could benefit from psychological help. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I went anyway. And then um, uh, I really got along with my psychologist. She was very, it was quite funny. I, in my, she gave me some homework in my first session. And by the second session, I like, you know, had done three times the amount. And she was like, wow, people usually take like 10 sessions to get this far. And I was like, you're treating me for perfectionism. What did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> like, of course I went above and beyond yeah. because. Is it your job this to listen? You're me for. <laughs> yeah. um, I forgot the question. Question was, uh, was um, what was the biggest unhealthy belief you had to let go, and then where oh, did yeah, it? The, where was the uh, being unlovable? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember being on the phone with her after having a falling out with my family, um, and she she told me to write down on a piece of paper, "I am unlovable," and to cross it out. And I wrote, "I am," and I was like, "I'm not going to write that. I don't believe that. Why would I write that down?" Mm. And I didn't say that out loud, but that's what I thought. And I stopped and I just held my pen there for a while. And she continued talking. Uh, and after the session, I was just like, this idea sat with me. And I was like, why did she choose to say that? Because she didn't usually say things unless it was on point directly about me. And I was like, yeah. why would she have picked I'm unlovable? And then like, the more I thought about it, the more I realized like, oh, this perfectionism is this fear of, uh, this fear of failure, which I really struggle from. It, mm. All of it came from. I don't want to be rejected by anybody. I don't want to make a mistake so that I'm alone and it's scary. And oh, I don't, you know, yeah, I had this yeah. like really strong bond with my dad. Um, and I was always told it was this like special bond. And then, you know, later I realized, oh, I, I actually just, I had a fear of losing him. So I just turned myself into whatever I thought he wanted me to be. So I was easygoing you know, easygoing means shutting off your emotions. Mm. Um, mm. And like, I was everything that I thought I was meant to be. And that, that was part of the um, learning to be my authentic self was actually learning to be me, whether my dad liked it or not. Yeah. Well, that's really heavy. I'm not gonna. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, that is a big question. Um, 
how are you doing with it now? I guess is the follow-up question. Um, good. It it took me a long time to figure out what self love is and how to how to show self love and how to practice it. Um, and I learned from my husband and my kids by the way I show up for them and the way they show up. Well, the way my husband shows up for me and the way I show up for my kids. I kind of I learned to, in that process of um, what do I want to model for my children mm -hmm. and how do I want them to see themselves and I want them to grow up loving themselves and entirely 100% comfortable being themselves no matter what situation they're in and to make choices that are aligned to what they truly want in life not what they think is expected of them or anything like that so yeah. um yeah and I'm I love myself now it's, it yeah. sounds weird to say out loud in this kind of context but um <laughs> yeah I've I've, I've learned self-love and uh a large part of that is learning how to practice self-compassion and uh non-judgment mm -hmm. And um, I think going along with the way you're presenting for your uh, presenting yourself for your husband or the way your husband presents himself to you and the way you're presenting yourself for the kids also is probably built in the you you want to instill in them, um, at least to me, maybe the assumption is wrong, but it seems like you want to also instill in them like no matter which way they decide to go, like you won't break contact is kind of the kind of the big one. Uh, yeah, for me, I, I tell my kids, it takes a long time for me to say, I love you to my kids. Cause I say, I love you no matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter how you feel, I will love you forever and always unconditionally. Mm. Cause I want them to know all of those things. Like it literally doesn't matter how, any of those things. I will still love you unconditionally and I will be here for you and I will keep showing up for you. Mm. I think that's wonderful to say, especially. <laughs> so it's long. They don't fall asleep when I say it either, even though it takes me ages. <laughs> <laughs> I say some similar stuff to my daughters, like, um, mom and dad love you very much. You're very, uh, we, we appreciate you. In, or what, what is it? Mom and dad love you very much. Uh, you're very special to us, and we're very happy you're in our family. Like, but yeah. I mean, those are the kind of the three. I appreciate you. Because, like, were you ever told that you were appreciated as just you? Not because you achieved anything, just you as a person were appreciated as a kid. Were you ever told that? Oh, as a kid? That one I'm not sure, but to be fair, my memory as a kid is very like scattered. So it could be possible that my parents did and just didn't register with me at all. But I, I don't know if that one, if I ever got that one. Yeah, just like I'm proud of you. Like it doesn't matter what you do. I've gotten I'm proud of you, but it was after I won nationals, so that was a little bit different. <laughs> Dependent on behavior. <laughs> I love you when you win nationals. Uh, my my dad told me later though, like so, just just as backup for my dad, it was uh, he did tell me later that he was always proud of it, uh, uh, proud of us as kid, like for his kids, because we, at the end of the day, we were raised well with good character, and that was for him the, the bigger part uh, than us winning nationals. Even though, when I did win nationals, he like cried because he was super happy. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty nice. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's the biggest unhealthy belief you had to let go. And it looks like you're, <laughs> you're going over it well now, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, what the, one of the things you talk about in the podcast episode that I listened to was you're, you're trying to have as many best days as possible. And so I was wondering what your definition of a best day is because we're both analytics and analytics like metrics. So. <laughs> Yeah, it took me ages because I think uh, I think that's the first episode, and I like listed off this big long list, and then later when I listened to it, because it's it's weird recording a podcast about personal growth when you're on the journey yourself, because you go oh, back yeah. to listen to an old episode and you're like, oh, my opinion has changed already. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> but I, like I think in that episode I like listed all these things that I needed, and I was like, man, if that's the whole list, like that's really hard to have your best day every day, and I have my best day of my life like very often. Um, and I think for me now, my definition is about um, showing up and practicing the skills and the traits and behaviors aligned to my ideal self. So that doesn't mean that I have to get it right. It doesn't mean that I have to do everything I want to achieve in a day. It doesn't mean that uh, I have to be perfect. It just means that I have to be practicing and trying. And part of that is if I make a mistake, part of the practice is practicing self-compassion and, and self like acceptance and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just, um, growing every day. Like, I'm, I'm sure you're the same. Like, have yeah. you grown more from your kids than like any other stage of your life? Kids. Um, I'm not sure if 
it's directly from my kids, but what my kids have done just because I, I do like spending time with them, but because I have to spend time with them, there's less time to do other things. And so I've gotten really efficient with the remaining <laughs> amount of free time. Um, so when I look at people who are single, I'm just like, you guys don't understand. Like, <laughs> yeah, you have no idea how much time you have. Use yeah, it. They're like, oh, I'm so busy. Like, you don't. <laughs> don't, have, like, don't tell me about busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm really busy and I'm really tired. Those yeah. two things now, if, if people don't have kids, I'm like, yeah, I used to think that too. Yeah. And and now like now if I have an hour, I can be so productive mm. in one hour. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's a lot of time. Yeah, like I used to I used to watch Netflix. Like who has time for that anymore? Exactly. hundred <laughs> percent. Um uh, yeah, so it's about it's about showing up and practicing all of the things that uh are aligned with my ideal self. And a lot of that is since having kids and since working on my emotional health is practicing self-regulation and patience and compassion okay. and empathy. And, um, those skills, the more you practice them, the better you get at them and the better I get at them, like my entire life gets better. Mm. Okay. I'm just curious when you're visualizing your ideal self, do you have an ideal self of you in the future? Or like what is ideal self to you? Oh, that's a good question um i have, I, have I, a, I think i have a similar program but i'm wondering if your program is the same as the one i'm running <laughs> i love the way you described that yeah. um so for me it's not like a a, an, a visual visualization for me it's more about um how do i want to show up so you know like when you've slept well and you're having a good day and kid has an issue with something mm. and they have big feelings about it and you show up in a way that is compassionate and um there's like endless compassion there and you just you get down on their level and you're everything that you ne they need you to be in that moment mm. it's 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 knowing that in those hard moments how i want to show up and not necessarily just with my kids but in general for me my ideal self is knowing how i want to show up in hard moments and then practicing um being that person in those hard moments, not just when it's easy to do so. Hmm. Um, I'm just curious, do you, uh, do you do visualizations or uh, have you thought about it or? Um, I, I thought about it um, after you mentioned around you like actually do visualizations of fights and things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, if I think through, I think through things for me, it's almost like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Is it like is it more I, I like prefer an auditory word when you're like someone's talking to you as you're thinking versus like you're actually saying something happening in front of you. Like if you were to imagine something, I guess is that. Uh, when I imagine things, it's uh, uh, it's like logical uh, patterns and thoughts. They're not visual. I d mm -hmm. I don't think visually very often. Okay. Are you uh, for me? It's oh, go ahead. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe it's auditory. Like I, like I have a running, I have a running uh, monologue in my head. Mm. But I, I used to think that was entirely normal. I thought everybody had the inner monologue, um, but apparently not. Apparently, that's that's. I think that's a neurodivergence. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Um, but I like it, it's a conversation with myself, I guess. Mm. Okay. I was uh, well. The one I do is, I guess, different than what you do because. I'm, I think of the three ways, there's supposed to be like three day ways of learning, like visual, kinesthetic, and auditory, I think. Um, and then I must be auditory. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you're auditory versus like, I'm very visual and kinesthetic. Yeah, I got, I got that impression. It, it, uh, that's why visualizations to me, um, I understand the power of them and their auditorizations. Is that a word? They're auditory for sure, me. But we can make up words. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a spoken thing. It's yeah. a, yeah, it's a, it's a, I feel like a, it sound weird saying it's more like a voice in my head than an image that I see. Mm. It's a conversation. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Well, and I'm kind of curious just because you're on a different um, learning pathway. <laughs> this kind of, I know this is like, we're going, we did a hard right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you were like, what should we name the episode? I was like, yeah, it's a conversation not going to go the way you think yeah, it is. Yeah. Cause um, very rarely do my conversations ever go the way people think they're going to go. <laughs> uh yeah well that's a good point um what i was thinking about was like when you because i'm i'm curious now like let's say you're going to uh you're you're gonna go to the grocery store to buy stuff and you're 
thinking about what to expect to buy over there? Is it just a voice in your head telling you what you need to buy, but there's no no visualization that happens of you being at the store and picking things out? Oh yeah, there's no visualization there. It's uh oh I'll visualize um okay if I if I'm like writing a shopping list um mm. which at the moment we draw our shopping list so that it's legible to a two and a four year old. Okay. Um I, I'm the only person at the supermarket with like my actual pictures of bananas instead of <laughs> bananas. <laughs> but um they love it. It it's That's made awesome. shopping it's made shopping a lot easier for a trick for you. Like um there was a period where they would like when they've moved from wanting to sit in the shopping trolley the whole time and they want to walk around, they would just mm. grab everything. And it drove me nuts because I don't want to say no all the time. And my home is a yes space. And I didn't want to make the supermarket a no space. I want it to be okay. an enjoyable family activity. So um, I started drawing our shopping list. And so like my kids like get really excited and they go and grab the thing that I actually need, not just picking random stuff off the shelves. And it also helps with the like impulse buy. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't put it on the shopping list. We're only getting things on the shopping oh, list. Oh yeah. that. uh, <laughs> That's a good tool. I'll take that one. Yeah. Actually, really well. Now I forgot what your question was. Oh, yeah. So like if I'm visualizing, if, if I need to think of that, I'll um, I'll picture the fridge and be like, was there still tomatoes in the drawer? Like I'll, I'll picture that side of things. Um, but it'll more be like a, a checklist in my head of what are the things that we eat every week? Okay, we need this, 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 and this. And I'll often, if we haven't used it in the previous week, I'll buy it again because I forget to check the fridge and I don't. I don't always do the visualization part of it. Mm. Okay. So yeah, for me, I'm I'm like a checklisty kind of person. Okay. Um, I was hoping that was, that was going to give a little bit more insight into the next question. The next question I was going <laughs> to ask <laughs> was like, question. let's say, so for your for your ideal self, there's a certain way you want to show up, right? And there's a certain I'm, I'm assuming there's a certain way you want to speak to your kids, especially in that one where, because you were describing your ideal self as where you wake up when you're full, you're well rested, and your kids having big emotions. I'm assuming you want to speak to them a certain way, right? So like, yeah. how does, how would you be able to tell yourself? Because that's in your mind, but like, how do you, how, how does that work out? How do you, how do you imagine that going? Do you think oh. about that, visualize, or is that like auditory and someone's telling you you're well rested? And then uh, kind of, I'm only no. curious about this, this method, this, um, this, this method that I can't describe. I just know what I do. Um, and now I'm going to go away and have to look into this sort of stuff about different thinking styles. Cause you called me the other day when you said about how, uh, Bill Gates thinks, I was like, Oh, I don't know how people think now I have to go down that rabbit hole. Thank you. I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm a little, well, I'm studying NLP which is essentially how to neurolinguistic how to, programming. Yeah. Um, oh, I said also, that years ago. There's a, apparently there's a new stuff. I just, I just, I, I touched on it for a second. Like I read like half a book and then now I'm like really into it cause I want to be able to help men however they're thinking and whichever way they're thinking so uh interesting because I, I remember learning that sort of stuff when i did business analysis um business analysis yeah i was a business analyst when yeah yeah but like how through. does how does that tie oh because that's what, <laughs> that's what i was curious because the, the way people think so like um if you're trying to elicit requirements for someone about a system for example um often people try and tell you the the solution that they want rather than telling you the requirements or they'll give you requirements of a system that they've already considered in their heads so you have to you have to learn how to elicit information from someone i see i see um it used to be called like gathering business requirements but it's not it's eliciting information from someone okay and part of it is learning to speak their language so like mm. uh, I, I don't even remember it now but like the way they look can yes. tell you how they recall information and yes. then the words that they use so um yeah, I was feeling this. Okay, there, there's somebody who feels things, or, or I heard this, or um, I hear what you're saying. They're yeah. an auditory person. Mm -hmm. um, like I often say, I hear you, um, mm. and I'm working <laughs> auditory. But yeah. I'm working on like incorporating more of them for my kids. I like I can see you're having a hard time. I, I can hear what's going on. That sort of thing. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I got to get back into NLP actually. Um, this is probably very helpful. Give you, I'm giving you more to do lists. Over here. Yeah, I know. Just adding to more stuff I need to learn. Um, and now I forgot what we were talking about. Uh, how would you, how do you imagine yourself oh. in the perfect day? So that way you know how to act now in the present. Um, it's checklisty again. I think it's a checklist because it'll mm. be like, yeah. Okay. I'll give you an example that it's complete so I think but I sure. suffer from allergies um like anaphylaxis level right um and when I would have uh when I would go into anaphylaxis my husband would become emotional 
and I would become very logical and analytical and here's my checklist. Okay. Uh, so he would, you know, be feeling a big feelings about like stress about the fact that like I could stop breathing and die type thing. Whereas for me, that wasn't, a, a, it wasn't something I felt it was a, okay, I can tell them having allergic reaction is the itching in my ears started yet. Um, has my tongue started swelling? Are my hands feeling itchy? Is it itchy? Like I would, I would be listing off where is the itchiness because I knew like if the inside of my ears started to feel like cauliflower was itchy, I knew it was a bad reaction. Mm -hmm. And so then I'd be like, okay, well, if I've got that feeling then I need to check my hands and my feet because my hands and my feet are really itchy and I've got the cauliflower ears. Like I need to be in hospital soon and I need to get the EpiPen out. Like, um, and so for me, it's these checklists of if that, then something else. Okay. Um, and so when, when my taking that, that thinking style back to like when my kids are having a hard time, it's sort of checking in with myself. So it's depending on how I react and now it's noticing how I've reacted. Have I reacted or have I responded is the first thing. And then, um, cause that's a big difference. And then yeah. is my reaction or my response based on how I'm feeling or am I actually showing up for them for what they need from me? And so then it's, it becomes a checklist again of like, okay, why are they feeling this way? Oh, I can see that this is what's happening. I might know that they're feeling that way because they're hungry or angry or tired or, you know, whatever else, you know, that checklist too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then it's, okay, what just happened that they're feeling this way and how do I respond next? And it's almost like decision trees as well of, um, um, okay, I, I need to validate first child, but second child also needs validation. And so how do I listen to her story without telling her I'm prioritizing this one. So I'll like consciously hug one child while listening to the other child. And then I'll switch and I'll make sure I've got a hand on both of them. And for me, it's, it's very much, um, it's, it's lists. It's often lists of, am I, there's these five things that I want to happen in parallel. Am I, am I doing all of them in parallel? <laughs> hmm. That's really interesting. Um, cause during stressful situations, Generally, that's how I operate. I guess I switch back into auditory apparently because I have the same mental framework where it's like if whatever, like let's if say this, my, then that. And... Yeah, that, that's a majority of my days. That's how I think. If this, then that. Like case when, then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, programming language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is funny because I'm not actually a very good programmer. My husband is, but I'm more of the, um, I like how a system works and how, how it integrates with I like data. Thing. Mm. I like big data, but, um, and information that you can gather from data, but yeah, programming, I don't, I'm not great at it. Cause I just a side note, like it bothers me that I can put all this effort in and there's a comma missing or like a semicolon or something. Oh, and the whole thing. Is, yeah. Like that was, that was my bugbear in uni. And I don't think I ever got past that. And my husband's <laughs> like, you, you can code though. Like I can pseudo code and I can have a conversation with somebody and understand the logic of code, but mm. I don't sit down and physically code anything just cause it's yeah. just not my thing. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. Well, I was going to offer, I was going to offer a way, well, I guess a method that, so a method I get, I guess I do, I don't know if you're able to put this into an auditory framework for you to use. Um, but for visualization, part of the reason I picked up on it was because if you do more reps, your mind can't really tell the difference between if it's really happening, if it's not. So if you were to like close your eyes and imagine biting a lemon and imagine all of the lemon juice is like going over your tongue and your gums or whatever, you probably salivated a little bit. Because yeah, I did went to that. <laughs> yeah, because your mind can't tell the difference. And so yep. um, for fighting, what I would do is I would visualize fights happening. I'd visualize scenarios repeatedly. So that way I'm getting extra reps and I'm conditioning my eyes to see and my body to still feel the same um, way. But now what I'm doing because I'm a parent and I have other priorities is like I'm slowly learning that if I do this for – uh, let's say I'm coming home and I'm feeling very stressed and I can imagine that in my head and then replay it and then taking a deep breath when I get home. So that way I'm more relaxed for my kids. And so doing that repeatedly helps train the uh, neural pathway. Oh, that's and, really uh, interesting. Uh, Huberman, do you, do you listen to the Huberman? Occasionally. I don't, I don't have, uh, there's a lot of podcasts with a lot of good information. So I'm trying <laughs> to like pick what I can because I, I got, we yeah, only exactly. got that one hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's like people who are like, oh, I'm bored. I'm like, oh, there's so many things you could learn. Yeah, what a luxury. Yeah. Well, my, ki my kids have only recently learned the idea of I'm bored. And, mm. and like, they don't like my response because my response is like, oh, that's amazing. That's so good for your imagination. I'm like, oh. It's not the response. I, I don't want to use my imagination, mom. I'm like, yeah. yeah, it's really good for you. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> 
And then I'll like, if, if they're in the right mood and like receptive to receiving information, I'll start explaining to them why it's really important for them to feel bored. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, he talks, uh, Huberman talks about um, uh, the visualization techniques and the stuff you're talking about. Yeah. For me, I tend to learn better from practice and because I'm a stay at home mom and because I spend so much time with my kids, like the things that are my highest priorities, I like just practice them. Yeah. There's a lot of reps in your day already. So yeah, a lot, uh, a bad. lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, excellent. Um, trying to bring us back to the main road. Sorry. <laughs> one of the um, one of the things I listened to because you'd sent me the video uh, about for the for ten minutes about personal growth and um, the language you use in your mind. Um, conscious you language. Wanna, yeah, conscious language. Do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Tell me more about yeah. how you got into it and what that means for you. Yeah. So it was interesting. Um, I. I asked before coming on this, I asked my husband, I was like, what are the things that we've worked on that you think have made the biggest difference in our marriage? Um, mm. So we've been together for context. We've been together for 16 years now. Okay. Um, and we've both been on this journey of self-growth for the last five years. Right. So we had a lot of unhealthy patterns in the past. Um, we had the same conversations in the past. We had the same fights in the past, all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and uh I was like, what is it that we've worked on that's made the biggest difference, you think? And he was like, oh, it's definitely the conscious language because it knowing how to speak to another person where you take responsibility for and ownership of your own feelings makes mm -hmm. a big difference. And be, because I used to be passive aggressive and because I used to think, so when I was younger, there were many situations where it was like, it was my fault that somebody else felt that way. I used to go through that. but Yeah, yeah. right. So you take on this ownership, but what people what I didn't realize for a long time was that that becomes a two way street. Mm -hmm. So you think that other people are responsible for how you feel. Oh, I didn't that's how get to that. I, I didn't get to that point, but I did feel that you were responsible for how other people felt. Yes. I had, anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know more, but we can, we can continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So it was both of us learning to, to speak to each other in a way that was, removing blame shame and guilt and it just focused on like how we were feeling and it it was actually quite funny because we had we had a transition right where we both started learning okay we we learned about the four horsemen and yeah. the triangle of drama and so oh, yeah. the, uh, you know avoid being defensive and um contempt and uh, i wrote down the four horsemen because I, I can only remember defensive and criticism um but there's stonewalling and what's the other one uh Criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. Okay. And we realized all those things had shown up in our relationship. So we started learning how to be more conscious in our language. So it was like, instead of, oh, you're doing this, it was when you do this or when this happens, I feel a particular way. I feel angry when you say this, or I mm. felt upset when you when this happened. And so we both started working on it. And I remember we, we went for a walk and it, we were both really sleep deprived and we we're having a really hard time. And we both just started this language journey and it, the conversation was like I felt really angry when you did this and then the other person was like yo well, I felt angry when you did this <laughs> I felt angry when you did it and so we we had like learned a piece of it but not the whole thing and yeah. so like our conversations were getting healthier and we were both trying so hard but we didn't know like we hadn't yet learned about it's okay to pause a conversation and come back when you're self-regulated mm. um, and we hadn't quite learned the importance of emotional regulation in the conscious language journey so it, like over time uh, over time, I think the biggest shift was that conscious language and then understanding how to speak in a way that you're a team and there's a problem to be solved, not you're against each other. Like that language can can create the ability for you to see a problem and solve it together as a team rather than see each other as the problem. And so when you speak, if you speak in a way that criticizes the other person and makes them feel like the problem you're going to end up in the tri triangle of drama where you're either the victim the persecutor or the rescuer and so when you learn to speak in a way that is clear that there is a problem or that there is a feeling that you need addressed or a boundary has been pushed or something like that but when you learn how to speak in a way that's like there's a problem there can we talk about it rather than i don't like what you're doing or you are a problem mm. um so i had a couple of questions one is the language, because this is something I've, I hear a lot also, it's like where it's you two against the problem. It's like, it has to be you two against the problem. How do you structure your language and tonality and maybe even body language in such a way where you get 
both of you on the same page against the problem versus like I am just against you. Does that make sense? Because I mean, yes, a lot of people go into it and it's just like, that's great. I would like to do that, for example. But like, how would someone <laughs> how? actually implement that into the into their? Oh, so the actual language. Uh, so shifting away from blame and shame has been a hard one for me. But but using that language of, uh, uh, I'm feeling sad. Okay, so more uh, focus on like your internal feeling. Yeah, so okay. I'm feeling this way, and then I think when you already started that journey if both of you are on the journey, it can be a little bit easier as well because you both understand that there's probably a trigger from your childhood that hasn't been unlearned or that there's an unhealthy pattern from your childhood that you still aren't aware of and you're trying to figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so like um, my husband and I are learning that we both have different emotional triggers when it comes to um, cleaning, for example. Mm. So like um, when I was younger, I was criticized heavily about like my cleaning was never good enough you know i got austrian parents you know you, you got to do things a certain way yeah. they were a lot more relaxed by the time i came around i'm the fourth kid but still <laughs> like I, I i received a lot of um criticism and uh so my husband making any kind of comment around anything happening in the house i took it as it was my that's responsibility and that he was criticizing me yeah. and so it wasn't until i realized that that's my perception him complaining that there's something sticky on the floor because we've got kids there's like sticky stuff on the floor yeah. uh like him complaining about that um is a trigger was used to be a trigger for me and like having an open conversation about um when you said that i felt defensive like recognizing i felt defensive but not just recognizing it for myself like actually letting him know like oh one of the four, four horsemen came up for me so i must have been emotionally triggered and then we'll actually talk about Instead of the fact that the floor is sticky, we'll go back a step and be like, oh, that's interesting. What about that triggered? Was it because I said it in a way that you felt blamed or was it because you had an emotional trigger? And then we'll kind of break it down and go, oh, okay. He had no intention of saying that so that I would clean it or that it was my fault that it was sticky. He was just he was just feeling frustrated because he stepped in something and like now he's going to change his socks, right? Mm. Um, and then one of the things for me was complaining. I used to complain and a lot. And I didn't realize how draining it was. And then when I spend time around people who complain a lot now, I, I can literally feel it eating yeah. my energy. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard because I used to complain so much and it was so normal. And then now if I spend time with people complaining, I, I, it's like you can feel it drain from your body. Yeah. Like I, I, I have like time can... limits. <laughs> yeah, I have space limits. <laughs> well, was, if I'm there already, that's like, all right, cool. Well, timer has started. So yeah, get out of here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know I just got here, but uh, it turns out I've got plans. <laughs> uh, we totally forgot that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think a lot of it has been um, focusing on like what is the actual issue and also identifying the issue behind the issue. Mm. So it's not that the floor is sticky or it's not that, um, you know, for, for my kids and you're probably roughly around this age for them, um, it's not that the cup was the wrong color it's that that they felt frustrated that that what they really wanted they, they didn't, didn't get. get yeah yeah so it's not like the cup is the wrong color it's like there's a there's a a lack of um a lack of feeling of power for our kids and how do we give that power back to them mm. and you know when you're having a conversation with your partner it's like it's not it's not this particular problem that's the root cause so what's really the root cause there and is there something that one of us or both of us need to work on or something that we can change um and yeah i think it's really hard to have those conversations when you are coming from a dysregulated uh, an emotionally dysregulated position and mm -hmm. i spent a lot of time emotionally dysregulated without knowing mm, yeah it makes that would make it difficult for sure yeah, yeah. i've had a similar journey but it, mine started a while ago i think not i think 20 probably around 2016 so however long that's been um but i think the, i think the book i mentioned before the four agreements i think was the first part where i stepped into it and i was like oh if i get upset about something there's something in my world that's not probably yeah you know one of the, the one of the best analogies i've heard about it is um you're at a park and there's a dog running towards you mm. And if you are somebody who 
has been attacked by a dog in the past or oh, has a view that dogs are aggressive, it can be really scary. If you have yeah. a dog at home and it happens to be the same breed, like you might feel really excited. And if you're somebody who's a cat person, you might be like, Ugh, a dog. Mm. Like the scenario hasn't changed. There's still a dog in a park running towards you, but mm. your perception makes a big difference. And I think uh, up until my 30s, I didn't really understand that my perception was different. And I think I might have had a view that my perception was superior without even realizing it. Mm because I grew up like being told I was the smart one. So I figured like what Your I thought experience. was right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is unhealthy labeling. <laughs> you mean the being smart part or like the spirit of you part or both? Both. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> unhealthy. Yeah. I've, uh, since having kids, I've understood how unhealthy labeling can be. Have you heard the Huberman podcast on, um, on labeling intelligence versus effort praise? Uh, I've seen snippets of that one. It aligns a lot with um, uh, with Carol Dweck's work around um, he quote, he growth quotes, mindset versus... Yeah, he, he quotes them a lot. So it's essentially that. Um, yeah, then, it's the... Oh, go ahead. No, no, continue. I was going to say, uh, I was lucky that my dad praised me a lot on effort when I was growing up, uh, more so than, like, you're really intelligent because essentially I listened to the whole podcast I was, like at two, speed, at two times speed, but it's essentially the... Uh, if you label intelligence like you're smart then your kid might cheat or take an easier test to maintain being smart but if you praise effort or like it's really good you take this challenge then they're always going to seek greater challenge yes and so uh two things come to mind from that one for me because i assumed i was smart i thought i didn't have to work as hard mm. when it came to academic things so like product. yeah so i just kind of i'll give you an example so um in Australia, you do your HSC. Well, actually, I don't even think it's called that anymore, but you do, you know, tests at the end of high school to get into university uh, if you're yeah, going yeah. to university. US, US has um, something similar. Yeah. Um, I, don't even, I, I don't even know what it's called anymore. Some acronym. Um, but I remember towards the beginning of the year, if you wanted, you could go and find out what they predicted your, your score to be with, for mm. what you were going to get into uni. And I did that and they told me and it was really high. So I stopped trying because I was like, oh, cool. Well, like I wasn't working hard to get that. So like I don't have to work hard. And then I got like 10 points lower than than that because like I still studied and things, but I didn't work as hard because I just thought, oh, well, that's fine. I, like I'm going to get that without trying. Mm. Um, and then so I've, yeah, I, I think if I had have understood that, um, if I had have understood that smartness isn't just this inherent thing that you naturally are good at everything you still have to practice you still have to work hard and um yeah it kind of it it impacted me in ways that i didn't really realize for a long time mm -hmm. and, and i didn't i didn't appreciate like I, I have always been a hard worker but i didn't put the work i didn't do the work in the right places for a long time because i just because you assumed they were there already to. yeah 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 pretty much that's that's an interesting but i would not have uh because, well, I, I grew up on the other side of things. So I, I didn't know that not working as hard would have also been a prior, byproduct of praising smartness. That's kind of an interesting thing to hear from the first person. Yeah, because people talk about the... the so dodging yeah. the bigger test part. Yes, and the, the, the expectations of perfectionism, all that comes with it as well. But for mm -hmm. me, there was also that there was just this expectation that um, I should get something I should understand and so I often would really st struggle internally when something didn't make sense straight away I wouldn't when I wouldn't get something straight away like for me I love IT right yeah. uh printers are like the bane of my existence sometimes I don't know why I just printers used to just not work for me and mm. they're so straightforward compared to like the tech stuff that I'm interested in yeah. and and so I would I could melt down in tears because a printer wasn't working because I felt so frustrated that I couldn't get it. Like what it's a printer. How can it not print? And how can I not know how to print it? And it became like this internal self-criticism of like, there must be something wrong with me. Uh, like, how can I not get this? I should be able to get this. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 it led to a lot of internal criticism because of the expectation of myself. I'm the smart one. I must get things. And so if I didn't get things straight away, uh, I became really self-critical and like the inner critic became very loud. Mm. That is pretty interesting. What, if, what are your thoughts on um, using the, the thoughts, for example, like I should be able to do this or I should, 
let's say for example someone's handing you a product but you have this um you have the language like i should be able to handle that like what do you think about that as motivation on the onset of a project like do you think that's good or what what would be a if you don't want to use the language how would you attack so that for me of confidence i guess I am trying to drop the word should and all of the internal shoulds and musts that I have. And I've really embraced the word (laughs) can and practice. I can and I am practicing. So for me, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, I can do this. I can practice this. I can master this. And Mm. a big part of it has actually been embracing sucking and like being really bad at something. Mm. Um, Because for me, it was like, you know, I tried to learn piano years ago and like it, it didn't go all that well because I wanted to play like Tchaikovsky when I was a beginner okay. <laughs> like yeah. and then I would play and it sounded terrible because when you start learning yes. to play piano it sounds yeah. terrible right I yeah. don't have the muscle memory and I haven't and I didn't visualize or anything um whereas now I've started learning drums and I really enjoy it because it, I can see progress a lot faster it's a lot easier because you can just like learn one drum beat and repeat it and it's not very good and then you repeat it a bit more and you get better and then the next time you come back it feels more natural so mm. like the progression was a lot easier for me than learning piano um, and because I had no expectations that I could drum, it, it was easier for me. Whereas with piano, I was like, yeah, I'll be able to play piano. And then I wasn't Tchaikovsky and like, yeah. I would just and not practice because I didn't, yeah, I didn't want anyone to hear how bad I was either. Like I felt I had to hide the fact I wasn't very good, which is hilarious because my husband as a musician will practice happily for hours and hours and hours and he totally gets it. So he'll happily have me practice and he totally understands that. But I often used to feel that need to like, hide my practice from people because I didn't want to let people know that I wasn't very good at something and I didn't want to let people know I was working on something until I knew I was good enough that I was comfortable to show them because of the whole fear of rejecting an unlovable thing but it it led back into that a lot (laughs) okay yeah um so instead of saying you should so let's say let's say right now you're going to get a project though so what would you what would be the internal language if if someone's handing you a a big project it's like I, I can do this is a better phrase yeah, than I, can I should do this. okay yeah and I think also the flexibility around like um not expecting that things will just work out ah uh, yeah uh, okay like because if you expect it to go perfectly and it doesn't then all of a sudden everything's chaos versus if yeah you kind of expect and it to like not go well the first time then it's like well this is according to plan so it doesn't matter yeah and like um I think I mean, from a, a IT projects perspective, you, you're basically kind of talking about uh, waterfall methods versus agile methods um, of projects of delivery. So if you look at perfectionism as a waterfall, like this must happen and then that will happen and then mm. that will happen and then that will happen. But like, that's not how life happens and that's not how projects happen. You have to be agile. You have to be able to adjust because things are going to come up that you didn't know that you couldn't predict. Things are going to change. Um, all sorts of impacts that you had no idea when you started out is, is yeah. And okay. so I think embracing that whole, like, you're not going to be very good when you start something and um, things are going to change and your priorities will change and your values will change and you will change as a person and just kind of accepting that and going with it. Mm. Okay. That was, that was interesting. Cause like usually there's a project or let's say it's something where let's say someone were to hand something to me at work that like is a big project. I'll just assume that I could do it, but I don't expect, I think maybe the slight difference is I don't expect it to go perfectly. I expect a few iterations of it for me to, to have it down. So I don't know, maybe it's, um, I think we are in the same, or maybe it's the connection to the word should. Um, maybe that's what it is. Like, cause I'm, if I'm, cause I'm thinking like, I can, if someone's describing a project to me or a spreadsheet or something that um, is coming up, uh, based on the estimate of my capabilities, like I can estimate if I, sh- I should be able to execute this project, if that makes sense. But I don't have, um, if I'm, if there is an error or there's a part of the project or a query that I'm trying to build that like I didn't expect, it doesn't, I don't have a, I guess a negative reaction to the negative, to, to it not blowing through completely the first time that makes sense yeah I think from my career perspective I was a bit different Mm. so like as a where I am now it's more of like there's nothing that can happen that I can't handle I know that now and so it's just a matter of figuring Mm. out how what do I need to practice what do I need to learn how do we make it happen yeah um, and that goes back to the tech startup side as well, because at the moment it's like um, there's so much I don't know. And instead of feeling overwhelmed by it, which is how I would have felt in the past, it's like, okay, well, what's the next thing that I need to learn rather than thinking 
I need to learn all of it. So part of it is really learning that taking, like chunking things down isn't just a, a project management thing. It's like, it's an everyday thing of like, I can't take on everything at once. What's that one little piece that I can do right now in the present moment and just keep doing just that one little bit and, and keep making progress. Yeah. Um, but in my professional career, I think I just always assumed I could do something because um, I, I guess I just assumed no one would hand me work unless I was capable of it. Mm. Like okay. I, I never, yeah, yeah. I don't think I ever took on a role that I thought, oh, I can't do this role um, mm. because I also worked with a lot of really brilliant people. Like I met some really oh, brilliant people and I worked yeah. with brilliant people. So there was always someone I could ask. So like, you know, if there was a, a tech issue, there was always an architect or an engineer who just knew what they were doing and we could sit in front of a whiteboard and, and work something out. So in my professional career, I think because I worked in such big teams, there was always someone I could ask a question. And one thing that has benefited me through life is I have, have always asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you're comfortable to ask a question and not worry about looking silly because you asked a question, like you can, you can learn a lot really quickly and um, people, people are happy to share. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, and I, I don't think there's ever a stupid question. Mm. I don't think so either, even though sometimes I feel stupid asking them. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, now I know. It's like, it's, I had to <laughs> Isn't ask. A good question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think interestingly, if somebody responds to you as if you've asked a stupid question, then it'd be Usually interesting it's an ego to understand, <laughs> yeah, what was the trigger for them <laughs> yeah. to respond that way. Yeah. Sometimes I work, even if it's not a dumb question, they still act like it. And it's like, I don't know. Man. It's... <laughs> yeah. Like, why? Why is that their reaction? Yeah. Um, so really quick, I just wanted to touch on this word should, because there's, um, stuff, there's some stuff like touted on social media where it's like, uh, you want to be, uh, uh cause I'm really into the masculine part of the algorithms or whatever. It's like, you should be working out, for example, like, what would, what would be your thoughts on generally accepted as good, good behaviors, like working out, eating healthy, um, making sure your money is right. So these are oh, that maybe you touch on in the health. context of should. Yeah, in the context of should, because it's like you should be working out is kind of like a general universal statement, the blanket statement. Okay, just... so the way I have reworked the language in my draft books is mm. if you want, dot, 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 then you can. If you so want, if you, you want to, if you want longevity and if you want to be off medicine for a long term, if you want to have a life, a retirement oh. that you can enjoy, then mm. you need to take care of your body. How do you take care of your body? Oh, okay. Well, that's where you start to get um, uh, uh, resistance training and um, okay. cardio and these sorts of things. So to me, it's a, if you want this, then you need to do that. Yeah. It's that... rather than you should gym. It's like, well, fine. You know, if you're not into, you know, like uh, for a while I used to gym five days a week. I kind of got into bodybuilding, bodybuilding for a bit. Mm. Um, and such now a diverse, I like background of things you got into. It's pretty interesting <laughs> to listen to. Yeah, I, I like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but so I, I got into gymming for a while. Um, like my husband and I took it really seriously. And then um, like I got pregnant and I still kind of gymmed pretty much up until I um, gave birth because it was like my outlet because I didn't have any other outlets at the time. And so I would like come home from work and like either listen to loud music or gym because I was just, that was all I had to regulate my yeah, emotions. Yeah. Or I, I played like Stardew Valley and, and Animal Crossing for like a lot of time. Um, but they were my, I've, I've moved beyond needing video games and music to, to regulate. But anyway, um, I still enjoy them, but I don't need them to regulate anymore. Yeah. So I, I was gymming for a while and I forgot where I was going with the story. What were we talking about? Oh, uh, we're talking about the use of should, but you switch it to oh. if, if you want. Yeah, so then. now, so for a while, I, I started to feel guilty because I know that gymming is good for me. And then I realized that um, I don't, just because I have the gym equipment and just because I know gymming is good for me, doesn't mean that I can't stay healthy. So if you want to stay healthy as a mom, you don't have to separate from your kids to go and gym for 45 minutes. I can you know, when they're engaged in something, I can do push-ups next to them or I can do like yoga and I can chase them around the house really like uh, a lot or I can lift them up and play physical games with them and, and rough play and that sort of thing. Like I can incorporate strength training into what is important to me and what I do have time for. And, and I think that comes back to that instead of you should gym or you should, you know, do this many minutes of cardio. It's like, what is the outcome that you want? Well, I want to be healthy in my retirement. I don't want to be on medication stuck in bed and I will walk. So for me, I need to exercise and letting go of that perfectionism of, of I should gym 
X amount of days a week for this amount of time. And I have to hit these muscle groups and do this many reps. Like I, I had to move away from that and go, okay, well, what are some goals that I can work towards that um, I can do within the lifestyle that I have without it being something that I'm not going to do because it's too hard to like get that situation when like kids are unpredictable and yeah. like toddlers need you at the drop of a hat. Yeah. So yeah. So if you want, if you want this, then you can. And then there's, there's multiple ways that you can achieve fitness without having to go to a gym, physically getting in your car and driving to a gym, you know, like I have a home mm. gym instead. Well, like I say home gym, it's like, you know, I bought free weights and a bench and a barbell <laughs> thing. It's in the garage, yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, there are multiple ways you can achieve that outcome. outcome. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be training like the guys that you see on Instagram, you can mm. incorporate into your life. Um, and then I actually, I, I think that you can have your ideal self, your ideal behaviors and be on your way there rather than like, it's either all or nothing. Yeah. So like, yeah, I'd love to gym every day and I'd love to, I would love to do yoga at sunrise every morning. Um, but like, I, that's just not where I am in my life right now. That's not the season of life I'm in. So instead yeah. I'll like do yoga with my kids climbing on top of me, which makes yoga a strength building activity. Right. Cause mm. like you got an extra I don't know how much between the two and 30 something kilos. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to find, it's removing that perfectionism and looking at what is it that you want and then how, what are the options for you to get there? Not you should do this. It's like, okay, we'll like take a step backwards, look at your big picture and how are you really going to get there? Mm, okay. Instead of shooting yourself and feeling guilty because you didn't go to the gym today. Yeah. That's uh, that was, it was kind of interesting when you mentioned should versus if you want then then it's the even the language feeling i guess it's weird to say the language feeling in my body was like should is like very direct and if there's a not then it's a hard stop like let's uh, if it's a should like i should go to the gym but i don't then it's a hard stop and i, I can feel like a weight in front of me but if i it's like if you want then it feels a lot lighter and like easy going yeah and i think for me the word should comes with obligation why should you do it because somebody else told you you should what is the you really want? Yeah. And so um, when you focus on, like, if you want, then you can. Um, instead of, like, I should go to the gym, you can be like, oh, I didn't go to the gym today and I really wanted to. If the end goal is just general fitness, okay, well, then just go for a walk today and tomorrow go to the gym or tomorrow do something else or make sure you do it earlier so that it doesn't, like, get dropped off your list. Mm. But, like, it, I, I think having removing the word should allows space for self-compassion and flexibility and um i know I'm, I'm very focused on personal growth and i take on a lot like there's no like i'm not one of these people that talks about it and then doesn't do it like i really i, I take on a lot but i also understand that it's okay to take on a lot and just make little bits of progress in different areas and that it's okay to be flexible and that it's okay to make mistakes along the way and it's okay to like not hold yourself to these uh unrelenting standards mm. Yeah, it's, it's um, been a process. <clears throat> Sorry. It's definitely like a, I was raised kind of on the growth mindset. Like just that's how my dad raised me. So it makes sense. What you're saying makes a lot of sense to me and just resonates because that's just, you just make small steps and there you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, it's interesting how, differently that would have affected you. you you probably wouldn't have been as successful in your taekwondo if you had grown with a uh without a growth mindset i i definitely don't think so um there was there was also a book when i was 16 called thinking body dancing mind where i was conflicted between my dad's advice um different coaches advice because some coaches are very like western style like all or nothing you're not first your last kind of deal and so i was very conflicted between those and i was like some of this stuff doesn't seem logical because if I wanted to win all the times, so why don't I just fight kindergartners? Like, I'd win every <laughs> tournament. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I ended up reading this book and it taught very Eastern philosophies about growth and just progress and focus on, on that. And that was really, I think, one of the biggest um, turning points, I'd say, in my mindset was uh, reading that book at like the age of 14 and then really implementing each little bit of it. So. Yeah, see, so you obviously had a, a focus on growth if you were reading that kind of material at 14, which is awesome. I was, I was like, at 14, I was, I wanted, to, I knew I wanted to make the Olympics and I didn't, I knew, even though my stature now is tall, in, in my division, I'm fighting people who are like two or three inches taller than I am. Like the average height, I think in my division is like six, five. 
so these guys are like massive um and i have no idea how tall you are oh i'm six three so some people are like oh you're so tall that's awesome for the sports like yeah until you put me in the heavyweight division where everyone's like six five and six seven like, <laughs> <laughs> i'm actually short <laughs> I'm so much shorter than you, but okay. Um, that's really interesting. But yeah. Um, so, well, what I'd read was essentially that um, to be a top athlete, these are certain things you have to do. You have good training plan, good nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, I, my genetics are not exactly the best built for this, but I want to win here. So like I have to use everything available. And one of them was visualizations and um, mindset. And so I was like, okay, that's well, see, one of those that's, things. that would be really interesting if you came up against someone who, you know like uh, do you ever watch boxing uh sometimes i, I rarely like watch other sports because like this doesn't affect my talk about <laughs> <laughs> so um i i like boxing every now and then mostly mm. only like big matches just every now and then um but i remember watching anthony joshua and um oh, i can't remember his name now uh he wasn't expected to win he's mexican i think um he was a uh he looked a lot less fit than anthony joshua who mm. like is kind of your definition of fit yeah. and Anthony Joshua lost. And I wasn't surprised at the end. There were a lot of people like, Whoa, that's insane. And I was like, yeah, cause I could, he, I bet he went into that fight thinking, yeah, I'm going to beat this guy. Look, he's overweight. And like, I'm just going to beat him. Cause like I'm fitter than him. Yeah. I could understand that he probably, I have no idea. I didn't actually look into it after, but I imagine he went into that minds with the mindset of like, I'm going to win this, which is what we were talking about earlier where I was like, Oh, I, you know, like I don't have to try as hard because I'm, I'm mm. this whereas the other guy would have come in the mindset of like this is anthony joshua if i'm like if i'm gonna have a chance i gotta go all in he probably trained a lot harder yeah. and so like you can get around physical stature and like assumed oh, yeah. things that make you win by by nailing your basics and working really hard basically yeah um everything is i think it's it wasn't like uh you don't rise to the occasion you fall to the level of your system i think was uh james recent. clear i think is that I think maybe I, I just remember hearing that and I was like, or one, I think before, before I got more analytical, it was like, you fall to the level of your training, but then I was like, but your training is, if it's not systemized, is not good. So you fall to the level, like that's. You fall to the level of your systems. Yeah. It, it makes sense. And um, and that also comes in with the level, like when you have other stresses in life, like if you don't have your foundations sorted. Oh yeah. Start to fall apart. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Oh, what I wanted to ask actually was, um, kind of moving away from like personal development, but like now so more so with you and your husband, because it sounds like you and your husband have both studied uh, personal development and relationship and communication um, techniques to have a better marriage because what you can communicate better, like obviously it's better for both parties. Uh, I was wondering, like you, I remember hearing in one of the podcasts before that, though, your, you had mentioned your husband had made you feel safe, that you, you felt you put your walls down around him. Like what stuff about your husband made you feel that way? Truly unconditional love. Okay. So he never, yeah. Um, he never changed the way he treated me or loved me less if I made a mistake or if I behaved differently. Mm. Um, and that was, different to my experiences in most of our relationships growing up and throughout life it was kind of like I felt expected to behave a particular way I felt expected to be easygoing and if I wasn't I felt a retreat from other people okay um and if I did something stupid which we all do um <laughs> we all make mistakes if I did something stupid or if uh, you know there was never judgment or a, a or a he, he didn't treat me like I was he didn't treat me any differently if I made mistakes and he, he accepted me wholeheartedly no matter what I said and no matter what I did. So it's kind of the, the, the things that I say to my kids and I try and impart on my kids. I, I have felt that and learned that a bit from my husband as well. Okay. Like that it, um, how do I put this? Um, <laughs> you have mostly male listeners. So I feel a bit awkward saying this, but, okay. um, uh, like as, a female, I think we are conditioned to be um, cautious, not cautious, um, self-conscious of our bodies. And my I, husband is... I think there's a lot of societal pressure for, for that. Yeah. And like my husband, I can be entirely naked around in any way, in any context and be totally fine with that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet 
if I step out of that and like, you know, I'll be clothed again, but I, you know, like any little thing that I feel I'm expected to do, I, I would feel the fear of judgment from other people. Um, and so it's a weird example, but it's like even my bare self, like I, I, I never felt any judgment from him and I never felt like he treated me any differently, you know, because I'm a female, there's certain times a month where you get bloated and yeah, you don't yeah. feel very confident how you look and things like yeah. that. Like there's never been any point that I ever felt judged or loved less, no matter how I looked and no matter what I did. And and, and I think it's that unconditional acceptance for who I am and, and no matter how I, no matter what happens. Hmm. I'm going to try and break this down into like traits because like for male listeners, I would, I, I'm listening to this and it's like, that sounds fantastic. And then I'm sure there's some guy in the audience who's like me at 16. It's like, how do I put that? How do I make those traits apparent in my relationship? Oh, I think it's like, um, because, because neither of us really knew how to communicate emotions, um, or feel our feelings. So it's not like that was something that worked for us then, but it was, it was more of a, um, Uh, if you're in the right, Oh, go ahead. If you're in the right relationship, I think you married your best friend. Okay. Right. And so I think it's that um, one being with someone who's your best friend and then just continuing to show up for them and knowing that like, no matter, no matter what's happening in the short term or in the immediate, that like, look at the long term and, and don't withdraw yourself. You know, like um, you see people have these conversations, like maybe the relationship is over because they had a fight. Like we never, ever had, uh, I think we had in, we've been together for 16 years and there was like one or two sorry my our doorbell is updating itself and every time it does it rings and it rings on all the google speakers and it's like a song that my oh, husband makes I could, like, it's I hear. <laughs> I hear. um i'm just waiting for somebody act the door <laughs> no it's uh it just keeps rebooting itself um yeah so it's it's kind of like you can't withdraw because somebody has made a mistake or because they're showing you a side of their self um, that is different. So if you feel like you're distancing yourself or questioning the relationship um, because of something you've seen, maybe it's not the right relationship. Whereas with mm. my husband, like there's never been a point like where he withdrew and you felt like that. Yeah. Or that our relationship was in threat or anything like that. Um, it, it's always just been kind of like shitty about a particular situation or a particular argument or something. That's how it used to be. Um, but it was never like, um, it was never an attack on me as a person or my character. It was kind of like acceptance of me, but like that behavior I don't like, which mm. kind of translates into the parenting stuff, right? So instead of instead of uh, our kids growing up feeling like they're not worthy or anything like that, it's it's um, particular behaviors are not acceptable. So all feelings are yeah. acceptable and normal and understandable and valid, but all behaviors are not necessarily. That's a very good distinguish. Or dis- um, I can't distinguish. Speak. Uh, Distinction. Distinction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's what I was going for. I promise I can speak. <laughs> <laughs> it also sounds, um, so as you're describing these traits and he's not withdrawing and, and the relationship is not under attack, it sounds like, uh, number one, that he, I don't, was he, would you describe him as like being stoic or like being a rock emotionally or was that, was the emotion? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Always. Okay. So it's not necessarily that. It's. No. Maybe it was I mean, he resolution. He, like he during conflict resolution, he doesn't, there's no attack, personal attacks. It's always about the behavior. And that's, uh, even though you guys learn communication now, that was like maybe one of the base stones base. base yeah, I, I think so. Uh, okay. it's, it's hard. So, um, he's my rock in terms of like, he's my support. Um, but in terms of it, not necessarily, um, cause I, the reason I hesitate there is cause I feel like if you say, um, that someone's stoic, there's this expectation that they don't show emotions. So my husband uh, mm-hmm. in the past has been better at showing his emotions than me. And like, um, uh, you know, I, when I grew up, like my dad never cried. I, I just thought men don't cry and, and women cry. Yeah. And then when I started dating my husband, I was just like, oh, men cry. Like I was really awkward the first time he cried in front of me. And then I just kind of got used to it because um, he was comfortable with his feelings. And then it, it's interesting because he had cried in front of me. Um, and then like, it wasn't until years later when we started you know, this journey that I kind of realized, or, or he told me that actually I, um, he doesn't cry in front of other people. And it was yeah. just something that he felt comfortable with me. So it's got to yeah. do with that comfort of like being able to be yourself mm. raw and not feel rejected and not mm. feel like someone withdraws from you. Um, 
because you've shown them a part of yourself that you've probably been hiding from other people. Okay. So it's, it was also, so it sounds like also it's def, it's a part on, it's also your part of accepting him even at his most vulnerable moment when he was in tears and then you like didn't withdraw, which I can imagine if you had done, if you did actually withdraw, that would have been fairly devastating from a guy's point of view. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is, I would say this is good stuff for, especially for listeners, because I know that some of my audience is, even though I'm gearing toward like married men, there's people who are like aspirational to be in a relationship. And um, some of them don't last very long in relationships and they want to know how to make a long relationship last. Well, I think there's two parts to that, right? There's one, you need to work on yourself and you need to be, um, you need to be confident in yourself and you have to do all the work that you yourself are not expecting too much of your partner. But the second thing is, is like, don't settle, like find that person that Mm. is your best friend. Like, don't just, don't just want to have a relationship and then just make a relationship work. It's got to be the right relationship. That's my opinion. Like you don't just. I mean, and I don't come from a background where we've got arranged marriages or anything. So, mm-hmm. so I know that there is there are cultural impacts of that depending on where you come from. But for me, like, you, you got to marry your best friend, and that's not saying like go and marry your best friend. It's like the person that you that you want to be with. If they're not your best friend, then then maybe it's not the longer term relationship that you want. Mm. Especially because I think maybe in this context, like best friend means someone you can be around, no problem. Like no, you're there's no masks around your best friend, and then. No masks. And also like, if you, if something exciting happens, who's the first person you want to tell? If something Uh, bad happens, who's the first person you want to tell? If you need help, who are you going to call? Like Mm. all of those things, like they, it's it's not to say that they're going to be the only person in your life. Like, obviously if you don't have anyone else, you become too dependent on them and that has its own issues, but like they got to be your person that like you fully and wholeheartedly trust and want to spend time with and want to be with. Um, And yeah, I, I can't imagine I can imagine that there's a lot of people who are trying to make relationships work that maybe they do love that person and they've got communication issues or they've got things that each of them need to work on themselves. And then you've got people who are trying to make a relationship work for fear of being alone. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. And that one's not not good. Yeah. Or like, you know, biological clock, I want to have kids and like, this is available now. (laughs) This guy's here now. Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) This guy's here now. Yeah. No. So, so, but, uh, I saw something, I saw a post uh, on Instagram today, something about um, like people spend so much time making certain decisions and then they don't spend as much time making decisions around uh, like who they're going to marry. But like it's one of the biggest impacts to like your life. Oh, yeah, that's definitely, um, definitely really important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's like it determines so much of like who you're going to become and what you're going to achieve in life and what your life is going to be like. Because if you marry yeah. someone you don't get along with, like, it's gonna great, be hard, you're going to spend every day the rest of your life it's with them. a hard life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, I'm also just curious because it sounds so just from the stuff I've read and I've studied, uh, part of you being able to open up and feeling unconditionally loved was your husband had set an environment of like psychological safety for you. So you yeah. feel like you're okay well doing put. that. One of the traits of that is, um, one, it sounds like not necessarily having no emotion, but it sounds like he, I guess stoicism isn't the right word because maybe, because stoicism isn't having no emotion. It's being able to handle your own emotions and process them and like essentially regulate. That's like one I- aspect of it. Um, but the other aspect of creating an environment of psychological safety, as far as I can surmise, is the tonality in which you speak to someone. Um, were either of those like contributing factors or were those like not really contributing factors? There's another factor that made you feel safe around him. I think it's interesting. You've mentioned tonality a few times. For me, it's not necessary tonality or body language. Yes, I care about those things and about conscious language, but I think it's also intent. The intent, okay, because well, I, I say tonality because sometimes I have the intent, but the tone isn't wrong, so my intent is misinterpreted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's and, like... and that's that's a communication issue that yeah. can be worked through. Um, but if the I'm better intent about it now, is there, that, before I was like, <laughs> why don't people just understand that this is what I'm trying to do? Because <laughs> the tonality. <laughs> um, yeah, but if if you have the right intent, then you can work through that. You can communicate, and even with 
core communication skills, if you're willing to try and you have the right intent, then you can work through those things. Okay. But and if you if you don't have the intent of understanding the other person and of wanting to make the relationship last, um, then oh, okay. you you know like you have to you have to have that intent of of like not just being there for them, but that but wanting to help them as a person. Mm -hmm. To be Makes their sense. best self and to, to want to do that longer term, not just like, can we just resolve this issue that we have right now? No, it's not about that. It's about that other person and you being their rock and you being there for them and understanding them and helping them feel safe and helping them feel seen and heard and validated. Yeah. Okay. So it almost sounds like maybe during these arguments, one of the things that I teach the guys is like, you need to have a long-term vision or at least like that you guys are going to make. And so... I guess was during these um, just so I can kind of understand properly. So, if I'm co if there's a guy and he wants to make his wife feel more safe, uh, and this he doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily stoic. It's not really tonality, but he has the intent to he intent he has the intent and he is able to express that like look I want this to work in the long term and this is what we have to handle now. Like that that's a situation that makes you feel safe as a spouse. Yeah. Or, so and and we can go back to our checklist idea mm -hmm. in that um there are things that you can do that improve your relationship if you have that checklist in your mind so things like yeah. um i think it's a six to one or five to one ratio five to one, um, like your, the five to one of like positive uh, to negative interactions yeah yeah so if you like consciously have that in your mind um like this is something i really consciously practice with my kids and it just naturally flowing over into my marriage. Like the more mm. effort we each put into becoming better parents, like our marriage just improves mm. um, because naturally we're practicing the things that are just like healthy relationship things, yeah. <laughs> which is what you're trying to do with your kids. Um, but like consciously um, noticing, like if you're about to criticize one pausing and am I criticizing because like, why am I criticizing? Is there something that could be a problem that we could solve together and I could change my language in the way I'm going to go about this? Mm. Or am I criticizing because I'm feeling grumpy and like, I'm just taking it out on the person I feel safe to take it out on. And um, if you're going to do that, like be conscious about it and let them know, like I'm having a hard time and I'm feeling frustrated about X rather than you did this thing. Mm. Um, and then also having that running in your head, like, okay, if I'm feeling this way, and I know I'm going to be projecting a little bit because I'm just not regulated right now, then I can consciously put the effort into like um, doing extra, like making sure I, I, I compliment extra or I, um, I go over and above on um, doing yeah. something extra to like balance out the, the crappy bits because like everybody has crappy bits. Mm. Okay, okay. So it, it's almost like... Um a very expressive communication and to a point where you're saying where you're at. And so like what I'm saying, even if it's grumpy, et cetera, it's not like, I'm like trying to process my own thing right now. So don't take offense to like what's going on. Yes. Okay. That. Yes. And okay. like also like getting to know each other's like triggers and things. Oh, so yeah. like, um, uh, if, if one of you, uh, experienced like the silent treatment when you were younger and so silence is, is a bad thing and then one of you experienced um where like silence is better because you were used to screaming like those are two very different dynamics and very different ways that you handle conflict so what if one of you like shuts down a little bit because like it's a bit too scary when it gets loud and the other one is like oh your silence is scary like those little emotional triggers that you may not realize you have um that's why like working on yourself and understanding yourself and like your own attachments as a kid and that sort of thing makes a big difference because you can understand like oh okay I'm feeling triggered because of the way they're behaving and they're behaving that way because of their childhood too. So the mm. more you like get to know each other's, we yeah. can call them quirks. <laughs> the more you get to know each other's things that you're working on, the the like the more compassion you can have for each other as well. And the, the, that compassion kind of breeds into a healthy relationship. Mm. I think. Yeah, I would, I would say so. I think as you're growing, as long as you're paying attention, like something that was told to me in uh, marriage mentorship was like, you as a husband will know your wife better than anyone else and that's like up to you to know and the original word of um, husband was supposed to be husbandry which is like care for i think it was i don't know care the for exact animals, isn't it? yeah i think so um, but it's because like you as a husband will know like how to best take care of the things under his like that will, how to best take care of um the things you care about 
I guess if that makes sense. So yes. things and then people. So wife and then kids, et cetera, et cetera. That's interesting. I've never considered the origin of the word. I wonder where wife comes from. I don't know where wife comes from. I I really just look at one side of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kinda gotta look at two sides of the equation. Either. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I look at the other side so far and so far as like, is it effect? Is this system effective? Or is it not effective? <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very, yeah, I'm very analytical. <laughs> um, so one of the things you, you mentioned a lot, especially is like regulating, dysregulating. Um, I remember you, you mentioned something like, are you, is there a way you can train your nervous system to, for this regulation to dysreg between dysregulation, regulation between like feeling maybe safe and unsafe is yeah so for me um it's it's kind of weird like i i i came to this understanding from like a a very diverse range of learnings um but your nervous system as far as i can tell it has uh, a memory of um when you have been safe or unsafe and how did you behave and therefore that behavior will save me again right mm, yeah and so you've got two sides of it. One is learning how to recognize you are dysregulated and knowing how to um, uh, regulate yourself and switch your prefrontal cortex back online and all that sort of stuff, um, which, by the way, usually just comes down to breathing. Um, yeah. You can do <laughs> physiological size and like reconnect everything, yeah. which is great. Um, but the second th side is actually questioning um, whether you're safe. So I, I remember like from Huberman Lab learning about um, uh, uh, cold exposure and all this sort of stuff yeah, yeah. and lunges. and yeah and i've moved to tasmania and it's cold here and like my husband and i would be forever chasing our kids around like please put a jacket on please put a jacket on but mm. but we're also learning that like like we're teaching them hey don't eat because we told you it's dinner time eat because you're you are hungry right okay. so we're trying to teach them to listen to their bodies rest because you need rest not because um it has to be rest time and eat because you're feeling hungry not because i say this is the time we have dinner and if you are feeling cold warm your body up or grab a jacket or go inside or whatever you need to do so in in learning that we needed to step back and let them take care of their bodies we had to deal with the discomfort for us like oh they're going to be unsafe but actually they're not because if they get cold they feel uncomfortable and they want to come inside. The fact that they're happy to run around with minimal clothing on um, mm. in freezing cold, like was beyond me. And then I started learning about cold exposure and I was like, okay, so there's this point where like I grew up being conditioned that, Hey, if you go outside and it, there's a wind, you're going to catch a cold, you get pneumonia and die. Right. <laughs> so to me, my, my nervous system was like, okay, cold equals death, therefore unsafe. Mm. But then the more I learned about it, the more I would like just literally stand outside. And I, I, I thought when you shiver, that must mean like you need to go inside, you're going to get sick. But then I learned that shivering is actually the like the burning up of brown fat in your body to warm your body up. And so I started paying attention inside my body. Okay. Burning up brown, oh, so brown fat. Yeah. I haven't heard that term before, but. Oh, brown fat is like the, it's the, I think it is actually physically brown, but it's like the the fat that's ready to warm your body up. You've got like fat oh. pads, I think in the back of your neck in certain areas. Okay. And so like that physical feeling of shivering oh, isn't like I'm unsafe. I see. It's the burning up, right? And if you pay attention, if you like are cold enough and you shiver and then you like just pay attention to your body, you'll notice you feel warmer. Mm. You don't have to take action because your body did something. That's not an unsafe thing. That's your body regulating its temperature. So my kids inherently knew that and they know that because like they shiver and then they feel warm again and they're like, no, I don't need a jacket. Leave me alone. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so like I started questioning things and being like, okay, well, what else do I think is unsafe that's like not safe? So um so that is uh, my husband yeah and oh, sorry that is yeah. safe like my husband watches a lot of nrl and so um f at first when our kids were younger i was like oh sorry nrl is national rugby league it's like oh, australian okay, okay. yeah ru uh, rugby more, league more uh more intense football for americans <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah. yes um, more intense <laughs> yeah um yeah without all the padding and stuff which yeah Anyway, That's so my husband watches a lot of this. And when my kids were really young, I was like, no, I can't show them that. And then after a while, I was like, no, it's actually good for them. Like they can see what competitive sport is like. They can see what athleticism is. And mm. because we homeschool and because we're both quite um, nerdy in like really weird ways, uh, my like we'll go, okay, that guy had an injury. And then we'll like follow the physios who will explain the injury and break it down. How long is it going to take to heal and what's broken and show. And like, we'll talk our kids through that too. Mm. And so like, we'll watch it. And like, you know, these guys, they, they get hammered. Yeah. Like I'm pretty sure I'd be in hospital for a long time, but these guys get like seriously physically hurt 
And then next week they're there again. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things that I thought were really unsafe, I'm like, well, actually your body kind of heals from that pretty quick. So like, even if I feel uncomfortable that like my kid might get hurt, they're not going to die. So it's okay for me to just regulate and let them and they can make their own mistakes without me like hovering over them. Like, no, you can't do that because you're going to get hurt, but it's okay. If they get hurt, they will heal. There's obviously like lines that you can't just let them play with knives, yeah. but like, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to freak out because they're climbing on something that's a bit too high. If they fall and break their arm, their arm will heal. Mm. Um, I think, especially as a kid too, I remember hearing, um, we have a, my wife's cousin works at Google, like daycare or something like that. And they said, at, as, as a kid, it's actually okay to let them play because um, kids will actually heal quicker than you do as an adult. So if you are going to test limits, it's better to test limits as a kid. Yeah. Rather than like, you're 30 yeah, and now it's rather, gonna take four rather, months <laughs> and, and then you've still got to take care of children while you're unwell yeah, yeah. Um, that's the hard part but yeah so it, for me it's like um when I notice that I'm dysregulated now uh in the moment I try and like regulate myself and deal with whatever's happening in the present but I spend more time uh analyzing it later not from like a rehashing and um uh I used to ruminate a lot, but now instead of ruminating, it's looking at it and going, well, why is it that I thought that that was unsafe? Mm. And, and like, because in that moment you've recognized, okay, they are safe or I am safe, whatever it is. And you regulate each time you do that, you're, you're creating evidence for your nervous system and your body to say, oh, I was safe in that scenario. So maybe actually take it off the unsafe list. Mm. So that I think that's, that's how it really feeds back into the, the um, comfort zones model, you know, the most people know the comfort zones model um and it like the comfort zones model to me was a great theory but it wasn't until i really understood um, cold exposure <laughs> oddly mm -hmm. that i was like oh okay it makes sense because every time you step out of the comfort zone and you survive your brain and nervous system are like oh okay that's no longer unsafe i can add it to the comfort zone and that's why your comfort zone gets bigger and that's why you you know there's certain people who are willing to do things that other people aren't because they know it's safe they've already had that experience yeah um yeah. and so yeah, a lot of it comes down to, uh, and, and if you take it back to relationships, it's it's okay and safe for me to tell my partner how I'm feeling, even if they don't like, even if their feelings might be hurt. Again, if you've got the intent of like sharing how you're feeling and trying to work it out, that it's safe to do that. And if the if the relationship isn't safe for you to do that, it's probably not the right relationship. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I agree. That's um. And it's interesting too that you you're able to tie that back to um, relationships because I think a lot of people see at least a lot of guys see like sport is like one one box in the mind and then relationships are another box. Because <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure for my husband, sport just is the box that goes of everything and other things just kind of in picture in picture <laughs> kind of sprinkled in on top. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, you can learn a lot from sport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then. I think it was, it was, uh, it's interesting to, especially as like, as a listener, if I was like a guy to be able to number one, open up and understand that it's safe. Cause I don't know if I think every, every guy has their own like life journey, right? So like opening up was not something I felt I was, um, I felt I was able to do until I obtained strength in strength and maybe even considered power in Taekwondo where it's like, well, it doesn't really matter if I cry and you think that's dumb because if we fight, I'm still going to beat you. <laughs> like there's a, there's a way to compensate for it. <laughs> yeah. We so also don't need to compensate too. It's yeah. okay to feel however you're feeling like mm -hmm. that, that learning for me, because I grew up, I think because, so for me, when I grew up, I was like one of the guys. And I think that comes from having parents who were divorced at a young age. I got raised with, by with a male dad, mostly right? yeah so I got I got um my conditioning and my behavioral models came from a male model so which is why like one of the things we've talked about is um uh, uh we talked about on Instagram how I think that a lot of people think that men and women are so different but actually we're not it's just our conditioning mm. like if you, if you condition men different. and women to be different they, they're going to be different but like um I grew up very pragmatic and logical because it was kind of like um yeah you don't need to cry about that because it's not a big deal or um here you can fix it like it was it was like if you could logically fix something then the then you can invalidate the emotion like mm -hmm. you don't need to feel the emotion because you can fix the problem but yeah. for me that led to my inability to just feel a feeling and like deal with it so I because of that I really struggled with um things that were outside of my control 
because I couldn't fix them and but I didn't know how to deal with the emotion so it, it became this like like stuck in my body I didn't know what to do and so it like came out in anxiety and then like repressed emotions and all sorts of crap <laughs> yeah yeah um I was actually well no, the, when when you brought that up I was I actually just got started thinking like now that you are um I guess more in tune with your authentic self and it's important for you to process the emotions I was trying to think of like in my experience when I when I do talk to guys it's generally like um it may be because I remember I, so I don't know if this is like 100% true I heard this from another video where it was like women tend to feel more like it, more emotions more intensely than men do for the most part I don't know I don't know where you stand on that is that true is that not true I think obviously it depends but like on a wide sweeping brushstroke scale like women will feel more emotion which is why women remember more things than men do because well, men don't really maybe want. women have been allowed to feel more emotions maybe that's what it is because if you were raised that like boys don't cry um well you've learned that it's not okay for you to cry but girls are allowed to cry mm. so like uh, and then and there's all sorts of things that feed into that i don't think i don't think i mean hormonally i've I've been pregnant i know there are periods in your life that you you feel more emotions yeah, <laughs> and yeah, there is nothing sure. you can do about it, right <laughs> so yes there are points in a female's life that they they probably have more emotional turmoil and emotion, emotional um storms within their body for lack of a better word but um i think men have been conditioned not to feel their feelings and and i say that with a small amount of confidence because I came from the very, like I've been called cold hearted and that sort of thing in the past because I had that very male view of like, well, no, if you've got a problem, you go and solve it rather than feel the feelings about it. So I've, I've read stuff about how, you know, women want to want to tell you about their day of something hard that happened because they just want to let it out. Whereas men will then hear something that apparently, yeah, happens most in guys are conditioned just like this is yeah, I'm, I'm hearing issues they, they fix the fix. problem yeah yeah Versus correct whereas like one of the big learnings for me has been to ask do you want do you just want me to listen or do you want me to help you solve the problem mm -hmm. and like i had to learn that and that's that's something that would be something that men would have to learn and i i get that point of view because i had that very what might be considered like a male approach to emotions yeah but i yeah. tend to think again that that's just how i was conditioned and how i was how i what I was modeled. And for me, I kind of grew up where uh, I, I actually had the view that like women were more emotional because like I am a bit younger than my sisters. And so when they went through puberty, I saw how my dad reacted to them. And then I like learned like, okay, I don't want to, I don't want to offer just make that. Mad. Yeah. And I didn't realize that. And so it was mm -hmm. kind of like, I, I saw his behavior change towards them when they were having big feelings. Um, and then, so like, I think I just internalized all my feelings. So I was like, okay, so people might retreat from me if I show them how I'm feeling, mm. which is kind of different conditioning from being expected not to feel your feelings, but it's the same outcome, right? You, you, you just kind of repress things or hold them in or deny your own feelings to the point that you start to feel numb because you like, you just don't know how to experience them. And like starting to feel emotions for the first time was, was intense, mm. like really intense. There's a lot of stuff that you just like you never really yeah. let yourself feel and you don't realize. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying like right now I'm reflecting on like my own experiences as a guy and talking to other guys. I think I mean there's quite possibly the the um the idea that guys are conditioned just maybe to not express their emotions, but I'm trying, I'm also trying to think of like, even among really trusted circle of guys that where I could let emotions in, like a lot of our conversation doesn't go in that direction. Even if there's an issue, it's generally still information back and forth and ways to navigate a problem. So I don't, I don't know, just maybe in my experience as a guy, it's different. Yeah, and maybe because, uh, I mean, if, if you go back to that definition of husband and husbandry, it's mm -hmm. your job to take care of. If you grew up and you believed it was your job to take care of your wife and your kids, you might um, you might behave differently than if you grew up being told that women are emotional and that um, it's okay to feel your feelings, but also that just women have emotions and men don't, right? So, okay, well, if, if that's a woman thing, then I need to go and solve my problem because I'm not meant to have these emotions, potentially. I mean, I don't know. 
that part, but I, I do think that there are a lot of things that are presumed to be male or female that like I don't believe is true in terms of like inherently we are that different. I think there's a lot of things that are just conditioned. Mm, okay. It, it, consider neuroplasticity. You have the ability to change anything, right? So if I yeah, wanted to become yeah. more male or more female and I knew what the differences were, I could just practice them and I'd be better at them. So therefore, why isn't it related to your base? programming and your conditioning in the first place mm. is my view i'm like trying to in my head i'm like <laughs> i'm like mental mapping <laughs> okay so so let, let's take it as a slightly different one you sure. grew up with this view like okay i can be a i can be a taekwondo uh, olympian right you, you had this view like i can be a taekwondo champion mm. um a female without any other females in Taekwondo uh, might want that path and not see it as an option because there aren't any other role models there and therefore the modeling and the conditioning isn't isn't the same. If you're a male and you wanted to go in sport, like now it's different now, there's a lot of females in sport. Um, and my kid, I can see the difference of modeling, right? Because I grew up like men play sport and you watch men on TV. And now like my husband makes a, a point of putting on the men and the women of like whatever sport we watch. Mm. So there's a lot of sport, <laughs> but like, but when my kids, so I've got two girls, when they see the women play, mm. they play, they will then go and play that sport. So we can, can watch, see, he'll yeah, watch the NRL every level. single week. Yeah. He can watch the NRL every single week, but until he watch, watches NRLW, which is the, the women's version, um, they, they kind of like, oh yeah, cool. I'll look. Yep. He's doing a great job kicking, whatever. But then they watch the women and they play mm. because they see, oh, okay. And now they're starting to believe, oh, women play sport too. Right. Mm. So if it comes back to everything. Like if you, if you believe a, a particular mm -hmm. thing. Mm. Yeah. And so if you're conditioned and believe a particular thing uh, and you're not taught to question that, mm -hmm. then, then you kind of just assume, well, that's like, to me, it's a, another form of a limited mindset is um, being conditioned to believe that you are a particular way um, because of your gender or because of where you grew up or because of X, Y, Z reason. Mm -hmm. so, I, well, so I understand your point with the model and what I'm trying, what I'm, in my head, what I'm trying to think about it like is if it would be, if adapting, if my current model that I'm running would be improved by the addition, I guess, if that makes sense. Because it's like, if if I'm really good at compartmentalizing, for example, in like um, Taekwondo is a combat sport, right? So even if you get pissed, you have to bottle that up and you still expect it to perform for another minute and a half because someone, if you don't, someone can kick you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty, that's a pretty obvious example there. Yeah, um, but, um, but I would, for personally, I would put that as an advantage. Like the ability to, compartmentalize and just take in information and but i think but having said that a lot i think i'm i'm expressing it but not in a way where i'm demonstrating i understand your point so let me think <laughs> <laughs> um uh, yeah maybe i could make the point in a different way maybe it's like a, well would you say by and large just i guess by in society that's generally just the way things are modeled currently yeah mm. i think there's a lot and um i think I, I don't know if you want to go down this path but for me like i watch a lot of my kids shows with them so because i I'm, come from a background of it and my husband does too like technology is a part of our life mm. and so i've i've read the studies and I, I can see that there are impacts of um technology use on children oh yeah which i won't deny um and you can see them in your kids when you give them beyond what they have and you don't find the balance elsewhere but i'm more relaxed than i used to be and that i think a lot of other people are for kids my age mm. um uh, like i didn't let my oldest watch tv until she was 18 months old like I, I was quite you don't have any screen time until at least that age and then my younger was a bit younger but like i, I had that back and now i'm much more relaxed about it but if you just watch you can see so much dysfunction being modeled in every single show yeah uh, yeah and and it's like these are shows that are created for children to help them build their view of the world and to help them become healthy adults at some stage mm. and yet we are normalizing dysfunction in so many different ways and we're normalizing um 
gender roles and we're normalizing so many things that like and labeling and um blame and shame and guilt and uh all sorts of like really poor behaviors but like these are shows that are like government approved and like yeah cool these are the ones you can show to your kids and you look at them and if you really watch them after learning psychology and uh, neuroscience and if you're really conscious of it you look look at them and you're like wow that would be we're just perpetuating a lot of really unhealthy shit to our kids. Mm. <laughs> like a lot of it, like, and uh, I, my kids are young and I will still sit and be like, I'll pause and be like, okay, when that person said that, that was, that was unkind. And the reason they probably said that was because of you know X, Y, Z. And, and it's not actually a, a healthy way to behave or um, like, I think I wrote it in my book as well. Like we, we perpetuate um, uh, um, urgency culture as well. Like I was watching play school and uh, like the, the phone rang for Big Ted and they were like, oh, Big Ted, like, you better stop what you're doing. The phone's ringing. And I was like, no, you don't have to stop what you're doing because the phone's ringing. Like, you, you know, you're teaching kids, like, you must stop what you're doing and be interrupted and not stay in the flow of things. And, like, these are just little things that I notice when I watch them. I'm like, wow, there's a lot of stuff that we, like, perpetuate. And this is where, for me, I, I think people would be – I think we'd have more parents who are more conscious of what they're doing if they understood how AI was trained. Are you still there? You went all. Oh, I'm sorry. Me. I think. Am I oh, no, you still. Yeah, you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah you froze, and I was like, um, people usually glaze over when I start talking about AI. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious to see how how it ties in because um, I agree that there's a lot of shows. I think. Uh, small caveat for the part about like generals. I think everyone should fit kind of their own little mold, but I think generals are there just kind of as like a. Generally in this direction, a lot of people have had success and that's why I think they're there. But beyond that, for, and then whether or not like you, as you become more self-actualized, can figure out if you want to do that, if you don't want to do that. But that's just my, just my small take. I was going to say beyond that though, I, I do fully agree that there's a lot, like I've watched a lot of shows and I'm like, that is not a good interaction or like, this is like obviously terrible or like that is a great way to set your kid up for failure in the future. <laughs> I see a lot of that. Like, and I'm just, I, I, what I was curious though was like, have you discovered any shows that like are pretty good across the board? Like, as I don't think there's, there's ever going to be a show that's um, perfect because there's, shows need drama what? and in order for drama, there has to be some kind of. Uh, well, I mean, yes. Essence uh, of. Drama in terms of like the drama that keeps people hooked and you have to watch the next episode. I disagree that that has to be in children's in children's um shows but like drama is in that you can show people i think there's a lot of shows that like um i think particularly there's a few american shows that are very like um too focused on being positive like, and what's, so what's it's thing, like what's a, thing, just because I'm, I'm not particularly watching all the shows with my kids but sometimes i'll notice so i'm just like okay you so, have any so pointers, let, let's let's start with some good ones <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I really look appreciate look i really appreciate daniel tiger which i'm pretty sure is canadian um Daniel Tiger, because they focus on, um, one, they have a jingle for everything, which is super handy. Because if, like, you need your kid to remember something, you can just, like, rattle off the jingle. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, I remember perfect. that from Daniel Tiger. Okay. <laughs> like the potty song and all sorts. But um, but Daniel Tiger is quite good because they show the range of emotions. Whereas I don't like kids' shows where they, like, all oh, the kids are happy and really happy all the time. It's like, well, no. Oh. Kids also experience anger and frustration and sadness and grief and all these things. And you need to show kids that that's okay and that's not and how to deal with it mm -hmm. and if you only give them shows where everybody's happy then they're probably going to feel this thing inside them that's like what's wrong? oh i'm, I'm meant sad. to be happy and i don't feel good so shows mm -hmm. like um daniel tiger are great for that or oh, there's a new one um bluey have you heard of that one some bugs. i love bluey. Okay, <laughs> I so. love bluey i would love to speak to joe brum and like give him some tips on things because like there's little bits right okay so bluey um, i don't watch it that closely but there's little like five minute segments where i'm like oh that looks pretty good. And then keep... <laughs> so I, I really, you know, I'll let them watch it. Um, like they can have control over, they can binge watch it type thing. Um, but but if you're watching Bluey, you know, there's one where um, there's one episode where um, he makes a joke and she kind of rolls up a newspaper and like hits him with it, and it's kind of it's made to be funny, right? Mm -hmm. But if the role, if the gender roles were reversed and he rolled up a newspaper and playfully oh, hit yeah, her, be... it would be outrageous, right? Yeah. So to me, that's like hold on, you're modeling something unhealthy there. Yeah. And But apparently because it's the woman hitting the man, it's totally okay to do it in jest. I get mm -hmm. that it's in jest, but like if the roles were reversed, yeah, or if they were joking and hitting the flag. kids, it would be honest, <laughs> People would right? be off in arms in social media. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but like it's, and and then there's like a season later, there's this episode where um, 
they, they do a pretend court because the dad farted. Um, but like, <laughs> it's pretty cool. I need to watch I more actually, of the episodes. I mean, it's a really good show for adults too because they, they actually explain a lot of something that there's. I heard they're actually very deep from my sister watches them. She's like, these are actually really deep. You should watch them. Yeah, they are. Like they, they show, I think they show how to like heal past trauma. There's an episode Mm. where um, they go into that and you kind of have to watch it from the perspective of like, what lesson are they trying to teach and what are they trying to show and model rather than just going along? Cause it's, it's an entertainment. Show a dog. Yeah. Show dogs. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, but um, yeah. So in that later episode, uh, the dad says something and they're like, um, the kids like yeah uh, she was like okay she was about to say we're going to do a family meeting and she's like all right you know what we need and they're like yeah whack him and she's like what no i'm not going to hit him and in my head initially i was like yeah you won't hit him and i was like wait where did the kids learn that and i was like oh i know a season ago you rolled up a newspaper and you hit that yeah. as a joke but like you modeled to your kids that it's okay to hit someone mm. and then now the kids jokingly like yeah hit him type thing and i'm like well you modeled that behavior and like i'm trying to learn non-judgment myself so it's kind of hard to be analytical of parenting shows and also practice non-judgment. But I would love to sit down with like the creators of all the kids shows <laughs> and be like, okay, here's what I've seen. It's normalizing dysfunction in your show. Um, and a big one is like uh, the conscious language as well. So like in kids shows, they've, they've come a long way oh. to like label emotions, yeah. but, but, but they say I am instead of I feel. And I'm like, mm. oh, so close. You could just go that little bit further. Yeah, so close. So You're coming close. so far. Well done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, part of these that's a curious is so like I since I am highly analytical, like um, or at least I would I would think I'm highly analytical. Uh, the part where you're like so I'm I I would be perfectly okay judging blue. It's like this is an okay show or not okay show. When you're saying like you're trying to do like no no judgment, like what can you expound on that? Like what does that mean? Oh, because you? <laughs> because I'm trying to um I'm trying to teach my kids acceptance and non-judgment right because I have this inherent fear of judgment that I'm trying to unlearn and I realized that the less mm. you judge the less you fear other people's judgments because you you just get on with That's your true. own life and you don't give a shit what other people think about and you stop thinking about them right because I used yeah. to care so much about what people thought about me I see, I see. And now I've I've given up on that mm. um and sometimes the thoughts still creep up and like I'm just getting used to the discomfort yeah um but it's 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 like I don't want my children to be watching the show with me and me criticize something that's happened and them think that they're inherently wrong or bad or not worthy of something because I've criticized someone else's behavior and they might do that themselves. Or they might think it's somehow if I do what they did on TV, then then mom might judge me and like feel bad about themselves. So I, I'm very conscious with my kids. Um, And I I try to take it into more of my life to be less judgmental so that um, one, it's just more peaceful for me not to be judgmental, but two, because I don't want people to think that like um, that they've done something bad if they do the same behavior, because I mean, you've got levels of uh, various stages of brain development and like my kids, um, you know, today, like neither of them slept that well last night. So they've had some very big feelings today and, and, and we've had a lot of, uh, just struggling to get along with wanting to play with each other but not being able to play in the same way that they wanted yeah totally 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 age appropriate and you can see you can literally see okay they're dysregulated and what they need right now is compassion no teaching no discipline no nothing just wait for them to calm yeah. and then we can we can yeah then we can <laughs> then we can get on with like either I mean you judge on the situation right do I do I yeah. do some kind of um, nuanced, conflict yeah. resolution or do, do you just pick up the Lego and keep playing yeah. um but uh, I've gone on a tangent now I forgot what we were talking about. um we were going on about uh, non-judgment non-judgment right so like they're gonna have stages for, completely aligned to their brain development where they're going to behave in ways that they've seen and they've been modeled mm. and that I am I gonna say that's not appropriate behavior like I can say that, but I have to do it consciously in a way that doesn't make it like, cause I would say like, initially I would go, oh, I don't like Peppa Pig. Cause like, there's a lot of dysfunctional stuff in Peppa Pig. That I, I heard that was a terrible like. show and has never been on one of our screens. I, I got the warning beforehand. So, <laughs> well, so, so I, I got that, but my kids every now and would see it if we wa- let them watch live TV and they liked oh. it. And so I was like, but hold on, if they had a friend that behaved that way. And I was like, I don't like your friend. Well, how's that going to feel for them? 
So mm. now I've changed it. I'm like, okay, you can watch Peppa Pig. You must understand that Bluey is a healthier role model than Peppa. Mm. So it's not that Peppa's bad or there's anything wrong with Peppa or that I don't like Peppa, but it's that there are unhealthy behaviors that are modeled in Peppa Pig and they could do with some work in many areas. And that I happen to think Bluey and Daniel Tiger are better role models. And so like my language has shifted because I don't want them to think like, oh, but I really like Peppa and you don't like Peppa. So if I'm like Peppa, will you not like me? Mm. I see. But I do overanalyze a yeah. lot of stuff too. Wait, I'm sorry? <laughs> I do overanalyze a lot of stuff too. Well, I mean, that's a, I think that's um, the... The conclusion, I think, is uh, is pretty interesting. I don't because it's also hard for us to figure out. Like something I'm trying to do personally is, I try and speak to my kids in a way that if my words were to, I speak, I try to speak to my kids very consciously in a way where I pretend or I just assume whatever I say will become true and stay true forever. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I don't know exactly what's going to stay in their mind. And so drawing the conclusion um, between like, let's say you don't like Peppa Pig. Uh, and I also don't like Peppa Pig, even though I haven't seen a show. And um, your kid not model in your kid, assuming that if they like Peppa Pig, you might not like their kid. Maybe, maybe it's just specific specification on um, behavior. The, the behavior and part of it, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah. And so like my youngest, she really loves Peppa Pig now. Mm. And, um, and I'm very clear on like, okay, you could watch it. And then if I see a behavior between my kids that I recognize from the show, which is one of the reasons that I will watch my show, the shows with my kids mm -hmm. is I'll be like, ah, are you doing this because you saw Peppa do that with George? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I can totally understand why you're doing that. You've, you've seen it happen and it's actually not that that healthy behavior because did it feel good to you when it happened to you no well then maybe just because pepper does it don't do it so you, it gives you the opportunity like a teaching um, moment. yeah and so also because we're homeschooling like they don't have as much social interaction with other kids as if they were in a school environment so it also gives me an opportunity to like have social situations where they can kind of see different interactions and i can call out like that behavior was actually quite unkind she could have tried blah um and then we can discuss things and then um yeah, I I think you can watch things that are slightly less healthy and have conversations about it if your children are receptive to that and if you have that kind of relationship where they listen and you, and you talk things through, mm. which I hope most parents have. Um, I think that's the goal. But but you can't just just like give them access to all of it and then expect them to like decipher for themselves. Not yeah, because they're not at that stage yet. So everything yeah. they see could be a model. Yeah. Everything they see could be a model of behavior. So like you have to be cautious of that. I, I I just came from a dinner actually last uh, or not really a dinner I guess it was more of a brunch over the weekend and one of the um, other moms had uh, there was food on the tables. <laughs> one of the other moms had mentioned that they uh, or, uh, yeah she had mentioned that you had to be extra careful um, and they're extra careful with, like whatever the kids consume because their kids don't have at their age don't really have morality isn't built into the structure of the brain yet so it's like anything they're yeah watching. i saw it it's acceptable behavior yeah it's like this looks fun i'm gonna go do that but they don't have a concept of like that's good or like that's bad yet and that has to get yeah so we're very we're very big on explaining what is entertainment what is a story mm. and versus what is acceptable behavior so if we're going to watch something like if we watch any older disney movies or even pick like i grew up loving pixar like i when i was like oh. 10 years old i wanted to be an animator at pixar like that was my dream or mm. dreamworks so i wasn't too fast but like <laughs> the Pixar had John Lasseter but um uh I like am very clear hey this was recorded at a time where we didn't know as much and so there might be really unhealthy behaviors and so like we'll watch something even just you know like the little mermaid or even frozen or things that people are probably really comfortable to put on in front of their kids mm. we'll watch it and then I'll, I'll explain as we go and then um, I will check in with them like the next day or later that night to be like, hey, did you have any questions from the movie? And I'll be like, yeah, why did they say this? Or why did they do that? Mm, and so I'm like, really oh, good. okay. Checking after a movie. Yeah. So because if I don't, I'll notice that they might have. They might um, take it in. As a yeah. Creator. And that sometimes they have like a nightmare 
um, because there's something that they didn't quite understand and they're like feeling scared about it. They didn't oh. get it. And that's just a behavior I've noticed for my kids. I don't know if everyone's like yeah. that. Uh, well, um, our daughter right like has lately been having nightmares, but we're also pretty sure it's because um, Halloween is humongous here in the U.S. And there was like a jump scare oh, thing that she it. had. And it was like, could you not have this near where all the kids are eating? Like, that'd be fantastic. But it's too late now. Like, so. <laughs> yeah. So I, and part of that is like learning as a parent that you actually have to keep processing with them. And uh, one of the things yeah. I learned that I was surprised about when I first became a parent, because I grew up where you just don't talk about hard things, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, learning that actually revisiting things isn't painful. It's part of the process, process. of healing from something and like processing it. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so like I put a lot of context around things for my kids of like, hey, this is just entertainment. And one of the things I really don't like in a lot of kids shows is this idea of good versus evil as well. Like there's good mm. guys and bad guys. Okay, but if you're making a kids show where you want to model for children how to grow up, they might pick any character that they resonate with. So mm -hmm. if you tell them there's bad guys and there's good guys and they resonate with the bad guy, you've just labeled them as a bad guy. What have you done for the way that they view themselves for the rest of their life? That is interesting. So like, like that's the sort of thing I consider because I'm like, if you keep pushing this idea that there's good versus bad, someone's going to resonate with bad. But if you push the idea that like everybody's different, we're all trying, we're all learning and it's not good guy versus bad guy or good gal versus bad gal. It's like, people have different views and things and then you resolve stuff and you show the differences and you like you could model healthy conflict resolution to kids instead of good won and bad didn't win well what did they learn from that they learned that there's good versus bad and that there's a battle rather than learning that you can look at a problem as a team mm. <laughs> and then they could have healthy communication skills when they grow up so like yeah i i have a lot of of um views <laughs> on a lot of stuff that they that we model to our kids yeah. as entertainment without realizing that like what you think is entertainment is like preparing them for how they view the world mm -hmm. and how they treat each other and how they view themselves yeah is there a point at which you would introduce the concept of good and evil because i mean i personally believe good and evil exists in the world and that evil shouldn't should be kept at bay like that's <laughs> so uh, but do you think that there are um I don't know about kids shows. This is why I'm anyone, asking, like, is there an age-appropriate time where you think? You oh well, should, you so, so for me, I, we talk about behaviors. There are some mm. behaviors that are better than other behaviors. Okay. Um, but nobody is born inherently bad. Oh, They're I modeled yeah, I and conditioned that. in different ways, right? Yeah. You could take one child, you could take the same child, and you can put them in one environment and they'll thrive. You put them in another environment, and they'll be a bad okay. guy. Mm -hmm. Like, so for me, it's it's really around that bigger context of of. There is good and evil in the world, and there are ways to um, not label people so that they put themselves in a box and they create a limited mindset about what they can and can't achieve and who they are and what their role is in society. Mm. You don't have to have a bad guy. Yeah. People can make mistakes and people can help each other to resolve things and problems. I, I agree with that. Um, it would be good. I, I especially agree with the part where you, where a kid may um, associate resonate himself with, with or resonate with a bad with a bad guy. I was kind of just yeah. trying to think back to my like. Well, one I would also say that you have a I, th I think you have a lot more compassion than I do. <laughs> now uh, in that context. Now I've learned compassion. I didn't in the past. Yeah. Oh, you've learned compassion. Yeah. Learned compassion. I practice compassion. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up. I I didn't. I grew up kind of on a little bit of Disney, but I also grew up with like, like action anime stuff. Like Dragon. Are you familiar with like animes? Um, like Dragon Ball Z and those ones. There's a very clear evil character because they, they look weird and they're hurting other people. And then it's like you're the good guy, and I have to train to become strong so I can protect people I care about. Um, I don't yeah. know. I I, know I like I Avatar Airbender. That. <laughs> that one's like yeah that's another that's a good one also because he, he tries to resolve peacefully as often as possible Correct. Uh, i haven't and watched he doesn't see the whole inherently thing. yeah oh, haven't you i haven't i haven't that's actually i haven't seen the whole thing but i have um uh, i've seen bits and parts and it seems like he does whatever he can to solve it amicably and yes. sometimes it doesn't turn out that way <laughs> and 
sometimes it doesn't turn out that way, but I, I appreciate, I actually really like that show. I've seen every episode many times, um, <laughs> but I, I like that they, there is this focus on, um, you know, there's a character, um, Prince Zuko, he kind yeah. of starts as this bad guy and then he has this, he has this dark night of the soul and transforms and he like, that a part of that that's really powerful me that I didn't understand until I was much further in my journey is he, there's this one episode where he, um, he's like sweating and really sick because he's switched sides. So he's literally releasing all of that mm. stuff from his body. And I never used to understand that. I don't still fully understand it scientifically. I'm on my way to understanding it, but um, we're going off tangent here, but my husband had really bad back pain for a long time, mm -hmm. like debilitating. He, he would have like months off work. And um, I started learning about all this stuff and, you know, I kept sending him to different specialists, hoping that we could help him in some way. Yeah. And one doctor recommended a book called Explain Pain. And I knew Mike wouldn't read it, so I read it. And in it, they told this story, not story, they showed, they were like, okay, so pain is, it's something you perceive. And yeah. that's not to say that your pain isn't real. Like, it, I don't want to be very clear. Everyone's pain is real, but your perception of pain makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. And he was, and so there was examples of people who had like really bad degenerative lower backs who didn't experience pain and there were people who had severe pain without actual degeneration in it yeah. and so for my husband he kept returning results of things that were like um like he didn't he had some degenerative back stuff but it wasn't as bad as what he was experiencing and so i started to challenge him on like i think it's your perception of pain and like his initial response oh, sure. was like no yeah. like no, of course it's... <laughs> of course yeah not. you don't understand i'm in pain and i was like yeah. no i understand that you're in pain but like it's not um it's something that I think you can resolve. I think it's an internal thing. And he didn't believe me at first. And then we went down this process and now he's like pain free. And it, th that episode didn't really make sense to me the first time, the first five times I'd seen it. And then I remember when he started to like release emotions and like let stuff out and his back pain started dissipating. Like I mm. remember that episode of like, there's physical things in your body that need to be let out. And if you spent your life like repressing anger, for example, um, feeling like you weren't allowed to experience anger or express anger because um, if you're not told, if, if you're not accepted for anger and you're not taught healthy ways of releasing anger, there's a lot of people that don't handle it very well, which is probably yeah. a problem in a lot of marriages. Yeah. Um, but he, um, you know, you have to release things and let go and then you don't have as much pain in your body type thing. But anyway, I went on a sidetrack there. <laughs> okay. uh well, I'm actually like pretty curious, like what kind of stuff did you, did you, was it just essentially like letting him, letting go of like emotional trauma is what cured the pain? Uh, as in how he got rid of his back pain? Yeah. Uh, it was like all rounded. So uh, one, um, we started the psychological stuff of like, okay, well, what is it that's in there? And we discovered it was a lot of emotions that were repressed. Mm. Um and so he started doing the inner work that I had been doing um, because like it was clear that I had psychological stuff because like, you know, my parents divorced when I was young and all this, all this stuff that was like obvious that I would have mental health impact of. Um, and because his mom's a psychologist, so like he could see oh. like, oh, well, you've, you've got stuff to deal with. Yeah. Um, whereas he was like, no, I like I had a really healthy upbringing, but like a healthy upbringing, a happy upbringing or like uh, never questioning how did your upbringing affect you and how you choose to process your emotions like that can have an impact on you and mm -hmm. so we started with um using like acupressure mats as well so acupressure mats reiki um uh psychological healing and like letting stuff out um and stretching which he kind of was like he used to just tell me no i'm not flexible and i was like no i don't think that's a thing yeah, i think it's just like trained, it's yeah. like a muscle you know, if, uh, it's like saying I'm not strong. Okay, cool. We'll lift heavy shit and you'll get stronger. Yeah. Like if you think you're not flexible, well, you stretch, stretch and yeah. you'll get more flexible. <laughs> yeah. And so like I had this view of like, you can be more flexible. And he was like, no, I can't. And so he started stretching and like the more he stretched and like um, he started, he noticed uh, like releasing of emotions so you can like stretch and like get things out and you, you like sweat it out or cry it out or whatever it comes out in, it, it comes out of you and then you, you become more flexible so i don't fully understand the science behind all that yet and i don't think there is actually a lot of science specifically to back that up there's kind of like your eastern philosophies and then you've got your western science and they don't fully line up yet but yeah. like intuitively if you've started this journey and seen the results like you know it's there and i'm still trying to figure out exactly yeah. what it is i think emotions that don't get processed get stuck in our body i've heard um, about that yeah 
I haven't been able to like explain that as like a cellular level, which I will figure out one day. <laughs> I'm on the path. I think to it might be. Um, well, I don't know how much of this is true, but like if if you're really stressed, certain muscles tense, right? Like if you're really like upset, certain muscles will tense in your body, and so if you're feeling a mild amount of that for a long amount of time, your muscles like always slightly tense. And so that's essentially like your muscle, your emotion, being tra like traumatizing your body. Maybe yeah, but, this is my this is my off the top head <laughs> explanation for so it. So I had a theory, mm. which is just a theory, and it may or may not have any truth to it. But I had a theory because a lot of people suffer from back pain, right? Um, and let's suppose that maybe it is anger or fear that that you hold there. If you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, your your nervous system and your like um, fight or flight type response is designed to like stop using all your energy processing thought and like re react faster and you, you send blood down to your legs so you can run faster right you can physically run faster when you're in fight or flight mode if you're running away from a tiger mm -hmm. and so i had this theory around like well maybe if you go into fight or flight because of fear or anger or like let's say it all I, I happen to think the root of all anger is fear and i haven't found anything to disprove me yet um but if if you were afraid and you went into fight or flight mode and like everything got sent down your spine but it, was, it wasn't because you were running away from a tiger. And in fact, you didn't use that energy in the way it was intended. Well, what happens to that energy? Is it like a lost packet in IT? Like it kind of goes nowhere, but it, it must exist somewhere. Like where does it go? And so I, I, I have this theory that I'm kind of exploring. I've had quite a few in-depth conversations with ChatGPT trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, but like maybe it's got to do with like sending energy down because of fear and like okay you're meant to use it to run and save your life but then we don't and so what happens to that energy if the message is never sent back up to say okay i don't need this any energy anymore you can do whatever like if you if you stay in fight or flight because you don't know how to self-regulate but you don't use the energy in the way it was sent down what happens to it that's interesting which is probably why things like exercise are really good for you from emotional yeah. re release yeah, like, perspective because yeah, you're using up yeah. whatever's built up yeah but if you do it more often yeah so i like don't quote me on anything there. That's just a, a theory that I'm yeah. exploring. That's, that's an interesting theory. Um, my experience having just gone in the ring a lot of times was afterwards there'd be large adrenaline dumps, but that's um, that mainly just has to do with me like shaking. So that was, so I don't know, maybe, maybe if the response well, is flight instead of fight, because obviously I'm going into a fight, so that's where all the adrenaline goes. Um, I would, uh, I haven't experienced your theory yet, I guess, or in a way that I was conscious of. So I, th I think yeah. it was more when I was trying to figure out like why specifically so many people suffer from lower back pain. Like, why is it back pain? Why is it that area of our body that so many people suffer from? And I know there's a lot about, oh, we sit down now. And yeah, well, that was going to be my first guess. <laughs> yeah. But it, it could just be that. <laughs> it could be, but it's also, I, I like exploring theories also. Um, the other thing, yeah. part of the, the back pain is it's like it pulls on your hip flexors which pulls on your lower back anatomically i guess within the body that's the, the other explanation i've heard but your theory sounds interesting also also because i'm starting to learn about energy for the first time like this year so yeah energy is kind of energy and vibration was like oh all these wealthy guys yeah. believe in this and i thought this was woo, -woo <laughs> but if everyone who's rich believes in it i would take a second look at this. <laughs> I guess I want to look into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, like I didn't, I, I didn't believe in a lot of this stuff until I got Reiki the first time. Mm. And, and I, I got Reiki, which for anyone listening who doesn't know what that is, it's like a, a Eastern healing thing where they, you kind of, somebody holds their hands over you. They don't even have to touch you, but you've, they, they, they become a channel for universal energy to come into your body and heal stuff. Right. And so the first time I was like, oh yeah, cool. Someone's going to heal me with their hands without touching me. Yeah, great. Yeah. And then I had Reiki. And I could feel pulses and waves of energy through my body in a way I'd never felt before. And I was like, oh, okay, something's happening. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but something happened. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I think there's certain things that you don't really believe until you've experienced them. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to believe things that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. Especially as analytics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um... I guess one of the last things I know we're 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 gonna we're gonna be like a Joe Rogan podcast soon. Um, <laughs> I've got I've got one podcast. It's just me talking for five hours straight. So like, Dang, no what a marathon! There you go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I was wondering what your, I guess, what are your thoughts on um, combat combat sports for kids and like rough and tumble play? Or are these in separate categories for you? Or what are your, what were your thoughts on um, that for kids? Well, so I think from a, the idea of like exposure to contact sports, uh, we already talked about like the idea that we use it as an opportunity for like learning. So like if somebody gets hurt, okay, well, what part of their body was hurt and how are the doctors going to treat them and how do they check if they're okay type thing? When it comes to rough and tumble play, like it's great for their vestibular system. I think a lot of people think that gentle parenting might mean gentle in too many ways. Whereas mm. like we practice consent. So like we need to know that our kids want to play rough and rough. And if at any point, like we, even if we're in the middle of playing, we're like, if at any point you want to stop, you just say stop. And if it looks like the other person isn't into it anymore, you, you like stop also and just check in with them. Yeah. So my kids... Like if they're playing rough with each other, which they don't do that often because usually only one of them wants to play rough and they get, it gets too rough too quickly because they're just young. Yeah. Um, but they'll play, like we play pretty rough with them because it's great for their vestibular and for their emotional regulation. Like there's mm. stuff in there that they need to get out and like they need to be thrown upside down and that sort of thing every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we practice, well, at least, uh, yeah, I practice fairly similar stuff like rough and tumble play. I was interested more so like what about like uh, were you, what are your thoughts on like your kid, for example, entering a combat sport? more so than like watching combat sport um i'm i'm okay with it as long as they go in with the idea what? that like if somebody says stop you need to stop mm -hmm. so if you're training with someone and so maybe that's not aligned to like competitive stuff but like you need consent and you need to willingly go into it and then we also explain the difference between like um fighting and uh athleticism so like it's okay for like we'll make the distinction when we watch NRL for example like it's okay for those men to tackle each other or women to tackle each other um they all know going in there that's the rules of the game they all agree that we're going to play that way and it's okay to play that rough mm. um it's not okay to just play that way with someone when they're not so I, we, as long mm. as they understand that, the that just because a behavior is accept acceptable in sport it doesn't mean it's acceptable everywhere makes sense okay yeah make sure you add context around um make con yeah add context around it yeah the, the, the limits of where that behavior is except for, mm. like it's not okay to just come and like taekwondo kick someone because you they're like yeah that's... playing with your toy <laughs> 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 but it's okay to do that if you're choosing to to step up Bar, to an opponent yeah yeah you, just for clarification just for taekwondo you, the, usually the first lesson after you like you do your first lesson for like most of the schools i've taught at was like if you ever use this at home we're here use this at home without permission you can never come back to learn any more taekwondo and the kid's like okay i want to do it here <laughs> <laughs> are you sure i can't use it on my little brother no yeah oh we use that example like can you use it on your parents if you're really mad no <laughs> we yeah. give we give like so, very, very specific <laughs> i like that it's good to know um no my my four and a half year old she's really excited about turning five next year because um the local sports like you can enroll in stuff once you're five years old oh, there you go yeah so she's like, I can't wait till I'm five and I can play this game and that game and this game. And like, she's really excited about it. And I, I totally support it. And there's a, there's a time and a place for that sort of thing. Yeah. With consent. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I wanted to ask was, um, what made you decide on homeschooling and what would be your best tips for people who eventually want to homeschool? Because a lot of people are looking at that option now. Uh homeschooling because i think the systems are broken and i don't agree that everybody has to learn the same thing at the same time in the same way mm. and um you like what's the point of a place that's meant to prepare you for life when like you could just live life <laughs> <It's kind laughs> of so there's i mean there's varying stages of homeschooling too you can do homeschooling where you just take your child out of the school environment but you you teach them in the same way like sit down and worksheets mm. etc so maybe the you're trying to avoid the social interaction if they have um adverse uh, feelings yeah. towards the way that the other children are in the classroom or like sensory issues that sort of thing yeah. um but i'm more down the path of unschooling which is like the whole other spectrum of like uh entirely child-led so like let your children choose what they want to learn at what age they want to learn so uh, like my four and a half year old loves maths mm -hmm. like like we, we watch number blocks and she will like intently watch number blocks and she'll like do a lot of math things um and they love craft and, they, they, you know, when they show an interest in something, we go down that path with them and we're trying to teach them how to learn and how to explore and how to ask questions in a way that you get the responses that you want rather than, like, dead ends. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's uh, a focus on critical thinking and um, exploration of curiosity 
what I think what we're really trying to foster is curiosity. Yeah, it's like that. Um, and um, oh, sorry, give, give we one. use we use technology as a way to like enhance their schooling, which is why I'm not averse to them having screen time. So like, um, my kids also have inherited the analytical thinking like they'll be eating a marshmallow and be like mom can we watch a video of how marshmallows are made I'm like yeah cool let's go on youtube and like figure out how marshmallow is made and then we'll go down that rabbit hole of like well how is other stuff made okay well they make this this way and like we'll go down the path of how things are made mm. and like uh i think anything and everything can be a learning opportunity you know like some people take their kids to the supermarket and like they take their kids to the supermarket to get the stuff and they go home whereas i'm like okay well let's learn about like, what jobs do these people do here how did this food get here where was it grown where did it come from why is there a barcode what are barcodes for how do they know how much to charge us what is money like we go into like a, a trip to the supermarket for me isn't just pick up groceries like it's it's a full-on ordeal mm. <laughs> not ordeal that's a got negative connotations but everything is a learning opportunity if you're willing to slow down and let your children guide you and listen to their where their curiosity leads them and follow them and, and like walk alongside them in learning i think a lot of people don't want to homeschool because they have a fear that like what if i can't teach my kids well if you can at least if you know how to learn something new where well, you can learn alongside your kid you don't have to be ahead of them it's okay to learn with them i'm, mm -hmm. I'm literally learning how to feel my emotions and how to regulate with my kids like and and it's great too because you show them like hey learning can be hard and it can be difficult and not everybody knows it mm. definitely a good way to model it i was curious to know like what would be um is the child-led learning is that different than montessori or like what would be the difference between like montessori oh, method uh, and no. like what you're doing or is it is it the same it's just a different different name? montessori montessori is a, a style of child-led learning particularly aimed at younger ages uh, yeah. unschooling i think it was uh or unschooling yeah i remember the, the guy's name unschooling is like a um sort of like montessori later in later in life like let the child um oh, so it's like montessori is like preschool interested and then unschooling is the next uh, yeah, I okay. I kind of view it that way. I'm sure there are people who like are really super really bad at you right there. now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, <they're> like, <laughs> no, there's a totally different thing. Yeah. Well, like for Montessori for me, we've we've incorporated Montessori around like setting up invitations to play for our kids, okay, um, and and like um, putting things out and letting them explore them in their own way, um, and uh, trying to let them be independent wherever they wherever they are capable of doing things. So Montessori is a lot around that, mm. whereas the unschooling for me the part that i'm most interested in is like letting them decide what they're interested in and letting them follow those interests so not like okay we're learning history today type thing or mm. okay we're learning math today like um if my kids show an interest in something then i will make sure that our environment shifts and changes and that okay. the, the activities we're doing shift and change to align to that interest that they've shown um mm. and like the, i mean homeschooling the other thing for me is you know, some days we have days where they're like, nah, I just want to just play inside and play like Lego for a while. And then I want to do this and do that. And then there's, there's times where we'll have like an entire week where every day they want to bake. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll, we'll do baking because you learn maths and science and art when you do baking mm -hmm. um, and you get to eat delicious things. And then there were other times like my older one, she loves running, but she won't run for ages. And then there'll be like, you know, a week or two straight where every day she wants to just like run. <laughs> she's mm. like oh, can we go and so i'm like okay cool let's strap on our shoes and go running but imagine being stuck in a classroom where like you have Water that feeling ride. like i gotta run oh we're learning math today okay what do i do with that feeling inside my body now yeah um so for me it's a lot about um uh i grew up with you know like you do what you're told mm. whereas i'm trying to teach my kids to like do what you feel is right and also listen to your body like if you need to exercise if you need to get something out if you just need to run or scream like don't hold that in like let it out like do it in healthy ways um and so like if my kids are having a hard time emotionally we'll do things where we you know the other day they they were at each other quite a bit and so we went and played outside marco polo you, did you play that game in the pool when you were a kid uh, in the pool but i don't know how to play yeah. outside like on land yeah well you just follow the same rules um oh, you just don't oh, shout of water but you you know you run away and somebody's shouting marco and you're shout polo and they got to scream at the top of their lungs and run and get all their energy out because that's what they needed in that moment. They just needed a time, a chance to like, just let all their stuff out. So like, we will play games that are aligned to whatever they need to process or deal with as well, which I feel like when you're stuck in a school room and a classroom, like if you've got all those big feelings in you, what do you do? Mm. 
Like how do how do you how do you sit and concentrate and learn when all you feel is like I gotta run, I gotta get this out of me, and I feel like screaming, and I like I don't want to be here, and I feel like hitting everyone around me. That's okay to feel that way. It's not okay to hit everyone around, hit everyone around you, and let's go let it out. Mm. So yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, I had a um one of the one of the guys who was my marriage mentor. He homeschooled his kids in I think a similar fashion. Um, he was telling me like I think this kid one of his sons became like an Eagle Scout, which is like the highest uh, highest thing in becoming a Boy Scout, and it's pretty it's a pretty uh, esteemed accomplishment I think because you only have until you're like 18 to do it. So if you turn 18, then you no longer have a shot. Um, I think his kid became like an Eagle Scout and he like became a Falconer at the age of 16 just because they let their kids explore their interests. So he did yeah. all this really, really cool stuff. Um, and like, they get, and I think as they grew over, it was also a way for them to teach them responsibility because it was like, like this is the year, this is the material we have to cover. Uh, maybe it's slightly different than the child rendering, but like this is the stuff we have to cover by the end of this year. And so however fast you finish it is up to you. And then he was saying like his, his daughter had finished the entire, the entire year's worth of work in like two and a half weeks. And she's like, yeah, here it is. <laughs> yeah. She just got to chill. And, and she like, chilled the whole rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she would have explored her own interests. Well, yeah, I guess that's the other part. She's exploring like, her own interests. But then when she had to do the actual work, she's like, okay, well, here you go. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to do this, but had to do it. Yeah. And I think like, um, if you have the time to invest in a hobby, you're probably going to get pretty good at it. Yeah. So like while other kids might be stuck in a classroom, my kids might be running or like learning how to surf or skateboarding or something. They might get really good at it. It might be something that they pursue as a, a passion type mm -hmm. thing. And like if they're interested in that and they're still learning and they're still becoming like healthy human beings, like what's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah. I think that's how the Renaissance, um, the Renaissance, I think it was all the painters, the painters or sculptors, the Renaissance artists all started learning apprenticeship at a really young age just because they're simply interested in it. And then now they have these masterpieces all over um, ancient Greece and Rome. I forgot what era they lived in. Across it's, Europe. Yeah, across Europe. And then people are like, how come none of this has ever come? It's like, well, because they've been training since they were like five. So. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, if you look at like a lot of, um, top people who are the best at something they usually started when they were like three or four years old now often that can be parent-led like it's the teacher was, even i was yeah, i was parent-led for a while and then i came back to it on my own later but you started at the age of four right imagine yeah. at the age of four already being exploring things that you're interested in mm. and like finding your thing at the age seven instead of at the age of 35 yeah you know like um that's not to say that everyone's going to be an olympian Genius. class in it they're not going to be geniuses, but like, I think it's totally okay for one kid to take three years to learn how to read and another kid to take two months mm -hmm. because we all do things in our, own, in our own pace. And I don't think it's fair for people to be held against these like curriculums. Um, and that's me having gone through the schooling system myself. Like there were a lot of times I was bored out of my brains oh, and yeah. like, I oh. hated, I hated having to sit there and like, it's pretending okay, I'm playing cool. video games while sitting in class. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to play Tetris in my head because it was <laughs> But, you know, like, uh, you know, then mobile phones came out and I could text in my pocket. Mm -hmm. um, and just hand notes around. But, like, how much time did I spend at school, like, sitting down and sort of being lectured or taught where I was bored and I wasn't paying attention and I could have been, like, doing, doing something. something or learning something at my pace in my own way. So, yeah. 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 Well, that was the last of my questions. <laughs> um, I did. Uh, you did say something about... Um, empathy you had a question about how oh. to practice empathy mm -hmm. um uh i wanted to answer that one because i i went back and i was like oh what is it there was one piece that i just wanted to share around empathy in mm -hmm. that um i used to think empathy was understanding someone else's perspective okay and f the big turning point for me was actually understanding not how i would feel in their shoes but how I have like when I've had that mix of emotions before. Okay. So, uh, so like, Oh, good. Yeah. I used to like judge people because I'd look at it and be like, well, I wouldn't be upset about that thing. Therefore it's not a big deal. Right. And I lacked empathy because I, my view was, well, how would I feel in their exact position? But you're never in somebody else's exact position. So what you're yeah. really looking at is um, 
to practice empathy, it's like understanding and tapping into when have I experienced those emotions at that intensity before irrelevant of what caused it. Because I think a lot of people think, well, we invalidate people's emotions unintentionally because we think, oh, that's not a big deal to me, but it's Mm. not about it being a big deal to you or not. It's about, it is a big deal to them, whatever it is. And like, when have you felt that way about something? And it doesn't matter how trivial it is because that's particularly when it comes to toddlers as well, right? A lot of people think, oh, it's like they dismiss and invalidate people, toddlers feelings because what, what they think is a big deal isn't the same. But the point is when have you felt intense frustration and sadness because something didn't work out for you. It doesn't matter that it was about Lego versus it was about losing a job. Like the context is irrelevant. It's like, how did you feel in that with that mix of emotions, with that intensity? And that has helped me improve my ability to practice compassion and empathy is understanding that it's not about the situation. It's not about being in someone else's shoes. It's about understanding that feeling that they're going through irrelevant context. Do you feel that, that, so my question with the feeling of empathy it would be like, because um, we both have checklists for when our kids are dysregulated. Do you feel that being empathetic to your kid helps them regulate faster? Or what would be the, I guess, benefit of? Um, um, regulate faster and also uh, a comfort with just feeling their feelings. Because I was often, I often felt uncomfortable feeling my feelings because like I thought oh my feelings are wrong or inappropriate because it's like oh you should know better or that's not a big deal or why are you crying about like why make a big deal out of it whereas it's it's understanding that irrelevant of what it is that has been the trigger for them that this is big to them in this moment and that's okay and so it's this acceptance of 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 acceptance and validation of their emotional experience irrelevant of what the trigger was I see so it's an acceptance and validation of them it translates elsewhere and it helps them regulate faster because instead of it being like oh there's something wrong with me and extending the emotion it's like a this is a big feeling and i'll get over it it'll pass Mm. and because and then when you do that do you feel the emotion also to match their emotion or is it you just trying to recall the time where that happened it's like oh i can understand why you feel that way the latter i think if you try and feel the emotion yourself that's when you're stepping into the world of hyper empaths and like emotional burnout and that sort of thing. But it's more about um, recognizing that their emotion, like the emotion for them. And then also for me, like if I'm feeling frustrated um, for whatever reason, I'm feeling frustrated is like, like um, detaching my emotions from their emotions. So it's not because they have big emotions that I'm feeling frustrated. It could be that I didn't sleep well and therefore like I'm not feeling as prepared for what they're currently going through Mm -hmm. and so kind of creating that distance of um how i'm feeling or my intensity of feelings isn't what's like what i need to deal with right now it's about making sure that they understand that it's okay for them to feel this way okay because well the checklist i go through is i think very similar to your checklist except i don't try and recall a scenario where i'd felt their same emotions does that make sense uh, I didn't necessarily always do that in my checklist, but that was what helped me understand how to give empathy. Like when I was uh-huh. at the beginning of my journey, like I was called out, you have no empathy, you're unempathic. And I was like, well, somebody tell me how. And it was like, oh, well, you have to look at it from their perspective. I'm like, well, I don't from their know. Perspective, their perspective. That's not a big <laughs> right? deal. So yeah, like, <laughs> if you're emotionally immature, it's really hard to consider it from their perspective because you're like, well, I wouldn't think that was a big deal. So why do they think it's a big deal? Therefore, yeah. their their emotional experience is invalid in this case. But it's mm. it's not. It's like looking at the emotion and like, when have you felt that mix of sadness and grief just mm. because you lost uh, somebody you love in your life and that was why you had it doesn't mean that them having it over um, uh, their, lo- their ice cream falling on the floor it's the same emotional intensity and experience. Mm. So it's, it's understanding that um, their context and their perspective is different and that's okay. But the, the, the experience inside their body is, is as intense as when you lost your friend, for example. I see. It could be. And so the intensity of the emotion is relevant to their context and their life experience. And so if you're sheltered, if you're an adult who's sheltered, you're not much different from a child, right? But people look at that as immaturity, but maybe you would be more mature if people created a safe space for you to feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. I guess what I was, I'm trying to think of like is um, this maybe just a selfish way to look at it, but this is kind of the filter that information just defaultly goes through my mind. 
<laughs> is um like it would be like what would recalling a scenario where I'd felt those mix of emotions how would that positively impact the I guess the end result versus of like them helping to or like them feeling more understood versus like if I don't do that but I'm still able to get a similar I'm still able to help them regulate without having to recall that situation myself. Like, uh, so I, like, I don't actively recall those situations myself now. Um, mm. If you know how to provide empathy and create a safe space for somebody's emotions, no, you don't need to do that. Okay. Understood. If, if you don't That's know where I was how like, to I was do like, that. I'm not sure how this influences that. Yeah. No, it's, it's <laughs> that stuff. learning path of like, if you've been called unempathic as I had been, and oh. then I learned that empathy was a learned skill. And I was like, cool. If it's a learned skill, somebody teach me how to do it. Mm. What is it? How can you provide empathy? And I couldn't quite figure that out. And this whole, like, you just have to look at it from their perspective is like, yeah, I remember. It, it's not <laughs> it because that doesn't work for me. And so I, what it was that distinction that I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. It's not look at it from their perspective. It's look at the emotional experience from their perspective, mm -hmm. not the current situation. And then compassion comes easier because you're like, oh, yeah, I remember feeling that way. And it's like really overwhelming and really intense, like mm. futility futility is something that my kids experience a lot mm. and like it can be feel really frustrating and overwhelming and like yeah. if you just look at it at face value of like oh that's not a big deal you're dismissive of the fact that they're feeling that real intensity of futility but if you as an adult feel fut futility you understand how they're feeling frustrating that can feel because everything's out of your control and there's nothing you can do about it mm. and you have to deal with it and so understanding that they're feeling that way in a different context can help with the compassion and the empathy you don't have to do it on the fly every time it's just to learn how to like what is empathy how do you give it oh mm. this is how you understand it makes sense okay that helped okay. me yeah I'm, i think if you had taken peterson's test back when before you learned this we probably would have both got zero on the score <laughs> i got zero and i was like yeah I, I got the same advice it was literally just like just see it from their shoes and i was like from their shoes it seems like not a big deal so i don't know what they're exactly <laughs> exactly so that that information didn't compute for me because i was like well they're making a big deal that and there's a, and if you're analytical as well and a problem solver you're like well here's the solution so why is it a big deal yeah. rather than you like do this actually looking at the feeling <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so it's it's that to me that was what bridged my gap of understanding of like okay if empathy is a learned skill how do you practice it oh you don't tap into their experience in this current moment it's the emotional yeah, stuff yeah see the emotion that's um after reading Chris Voss's book, that's where I was like, oh, you just, that's the part that has to happen first for some people. So just do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess what, I mean, I can cut anything if you want. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted me to ask you that I can ask you and I can just cut the section where I'm asking you this question out? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. Okay. Um, uh, but I will say if anyone's listening and they're interested in knowing more, they can obviously oh, yeah. listen to my podcast. Mm. Uh, the podcast is No More Do Better. It's on Spotify and Apple. Um, and if you are so inclined, I did self-publish the first three books and then I've unpublished them because I'm actually going through an editor now. Um, but you can like uh, on my website, you can sign up and get notified when they come out. Or if you um, would like to like fast track um, uh, personal growth i have an online course as well um so you can find all the details for all of that at processingmind.com awesome well oh and, and if you have a business and you want to sell anything online you can check out copytweaker.com there you go <laughs> <laughs> there's the other plug awesome well it was a, it was awesome talking to you lisa um i'm going to do the intro probably right after i got like a glass of water 